So first, I want to thank you for coming all the way out here. I'm sitting down with Aaron Marshall, who is a city council candidate for City of Seattle. Um, thank you for driving all the way out. Obviously, this is convenient for pretty much nobody. It's a little bit outside of town. <laughs> it's beautiful out here. Yeah, thank you. Um, wanted to be able to sit down with you. You know, I got to meet you some weeks ago mm -hmm. when you first came out and announced your candidacy. Yeah. And started getting more um, familiar with what you stand for and what drives you. I was hoping to be able to get a chance to help the public understand better because my sense and from the day that I met you mm -hmm. is the media doesn't seem to really be giving you much of an opportunity to get that message out. Yeah. Uh, I thought for sure there would be more curiosity. I mean, to me, that's what journalism kind of is, is that curiosity to know about others and their viewpoints. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, I'm a frontline Seattle police officer. I'm in one of the most proactive teams on the Seattle Police Department called the Community Response Group. We are currently tasked with being part of the Community Violence Task Force in downtown Seattle. So our primary mission right now is to get guns off the street, violent felons off the street, to be there for any possible um, acts of violence in a proactive manner, uh, whether it be undercover or in uniform. I thought that would be kind of intriguing for some of the news organizations to be uh, uh, to show up to some of the events and, and want, want to interview me. And so three months ago in May, uh, I think friends of a friend uh, gave me your name. And I was at the time thinking, man, I'm going to have every news organization that there is down here. They're all going to want to film me. I'm going to have radio down here and everything. And you were the only one to show up, which... Man, I very, very, very much thank you for that. And, and thank you for doing this long-form podcast. I've really wanted to sit down and talk in a more in-depth fashion with somebody. And I love independent media. You know, that's, that's usually my source of information and news um, at this point in my life as well. But, uh, yeah, for three months, you know, I have a professional who was working with me who was a public information officer for the Seattle Police Department. She was a public information officer for the United States Navy. She certainly has... Uh, great experience putting out press releases. So we did a press release for my announcement. Um, the friend in the media said, make sure you call uh, editorial desks the morning of. I did that. Everybody got it. Everybody was on the same page and nobody showed up. Then uh, about a month later, uh, Carmen Best, the former chief of the Seattle Police Department, endorsed me. Uh, I put out another press release for that. Did the same thing. Called in the morning, made sure that everybody got it. And uh, they said yes, <laughs> and, and uh, they were more curious about Carmen Besson, and, and they wanted to know if I could have, they could have her personal phone number, which, of course, I declined, but uh, no curiosity about why she endorsed me, you know, wanted to talk to her about me or wanting to talk to me about her and her experience with the Seattle City Council. It was really frustrating, and so here we are four days, three days away from the election, and Friday was just a big day for whatever reason. Cairo Radio reached out to me on Friday, actually the week before they reached out, but I, my interview was Friday. They, they did, wanted to do all of the candidates for District 7. So I finally got a chance to sit down and do a little bit of a longer form. I think it ended up, I think they slated it for about 10 minutes. I ended up getting 23 minutes. They did two segments and then they even talked about me after I left for the second hour of the show, which was really flattering and really nice. I think because I'm a Seattle police officer, there's been a lot of questions about the Seattle Police Department that people want to talk to me about. And I'm limited to some of the things I can talk about, tactics, um, current cases I can't talk about. But um, other than that, I've been given pretty much free reign to talk about most anything. Certainly, living in downtown, I know a lot about downtown, and I happen to know a lot about public safety as well. But uh, on Friday after that show, I, I just greenlit everybody. You know, I was trying really hard to make sure that I wasn't seen as just a Republican candidate because I'm not a Republican. Um, I'm not a Democrat, but I'm definitely not a Republican. I can go on for hours about both parties and, and some of my uh, dislike of the things they've done over the last, well, most of my adult life, really. I'm very much an independent, and it's not some gimmick just because I'm running in Seattle, a very Democratic town. It's exactly how I am. I feel like I've never really had, um, I've been on a political island most of my adult life. And so I've never really seen eye to eye with either party. So after the G and Ursula show, it went really, really well. So my phone all of a sudden kind of blew up. I ended up doing um, Jason Rands right after that. It was my third time on his show. Um, I greenlit Jonathan Cho. So we went down and did a walk and talk through downtown Seattle um, uh, in the afternoon. I went back and did Brandy Cruz's show for the second time. And then um, I finished off and Fox News out of New York called me and they wanted to sit and interview me. So... 
like I said, I'm not a big Fox News fan. I'm not a big fan of CNN or MSNBC, but I'll say yes to anybody that wants to talk to me. And so we had a little five-minute conversation and made national news. So um, we're three days out from the election, and uh, I reached out to you because I had seen your stuff on Instagram and was really impressed with how you uh, report the news, that it's, I don't find it biased. I, you're just, you know, you're kind of like me. You call the balls and strikes as you see them. And I had heard that you were starting a podcast. So that's been my dream is to really get on a more long form uh, format so we can talk about some things in a lot more detail where we don't have commercial breaks and, uh, you know, that kind of look from a producer that's saying, like, you know, wrap it up, let's go. So that's why I'm here. Awesome. Um, a couple of things that stood out to me. So when I came out to see you, I thought I knew law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going against Andrew Lewis, who I'm sure we'll talk about a lot today. Sure. Um, and in my mind, I thought, okay, this is going to be a law and order type of speech, and it's going to be about how dark and uh, terrible things are, and then yeah. the answer. The, the scare tactics. Right. Yeah. And I, I was delightfully surprised to see how really uh, optimistic you are, yeah. how much you love the city. Your experience is different than a lot of candidates in that you are not here with a family. You don't have kids. You mm -hmm. don't have a wife. You're able to live the single person's experience, which is a lot of people's experience yeah. in Seattle. And it was interesting. I heard some, and I'm a uh, renter. Yes. <laughs> and in one of your other interviews, you talked about uh, some people like Andrew Lewis see their see it through a certain lens and probably don't experience a lot of what this city has. And you yeah. do. And so tell me a little bit about what is your experience in Seattle? Um, how long have you been here? What What do you like to do out here? What is your experience in a downtown like this? Yeah, my dad got out of the Air Force in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. We moved around a little bit. My dad was from um, the southern part of the United States, uh, Tennessee, Missouri. He grew up in St. Louis. My mom um, is more of a Midwestern. She's Michigan and actually Canadian, uh, was Canadian. Now she's an American citizen. But um, my mom went to school out here to the University of Washington back in the, I guess it would be late 60s, early 70s, and graduated uh, the University of Washington. And my dad had uh, gone to the United States Air Force Academy and visited her a few times out in Seattle. And his words, not mine, you know, coming and living and growing up in St. Louis and coming out to Seattle really opened his eyes. He really fell in love with the Pacific Northwest. And, and I think my mom was already a big fan of it as well, but I think it was my dad who was the big driver of us moving out here. So when my dad got out of the Air Force um, and my mom was a Montessori, Montessori school teacher uh, in Europe, where I was born in Germany uh, on a U.S. Air Force base, <clears throat> we slowly made our way back to Seattle, you know, via Florida, visiting family in Tennessee and Missouri, but eventually made our way back out here. And at the time, Kirkland was a blue collar town. It was the only place that my dad could afford a, a house. Uh, my dad and mom could afford a house. Uh, it was Kirkland, West Seattle. These were all kind of like blue collar, Boeing, machine worker towns. So I uh, spent the 80s and 90s in Kirkland. I uh, went to Lake Washington High School. Uh, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps when I was 19 years old. And um, when I got out in 2002, I also really missed Seattle. Um, my family was all, my immediate family was out here and I really wanted to come back. So I was excited to be full-time in Seattle. And um, by 2002, Kirkland, was, Kirkland had moved on, you know, it had become far more expensive and I was way more interested in downtown. You know, when I was in high school, downtown was like probably the same for you, oh, yeah. the cool place to go. Like, Absolutely. you know, the great nightlife, <laughs> things you couldn't do in the rest of like little Kirkland, you know, 24 hour diners and, you know, Pearl Jam played out here yes. and, you know, Nirvana was at this bar and, oh my God, I saw Dave Matthews the other day at this bar. And so it really intrigued me. And so I moved out, I moved to Capitol Hill first. Uh, I only lasted in Capitol Hill for about a year and a half. I think my car got broken into like four times in a row and I'd had enough of Capitol Hill. I really liked it. I live right near Glows, which I still think is one of the best morning diner places there are in the city was, I guess it were just reopened. Um, so I eventually moved into downtown. I've kind of been there ever since. Uh, I had a short little stint over in Ellensburg um, going to school, attempting to go back to college. Uh, I opened a casino over there, of all things. And so uh, quickly moved back to Seattle. And uh, I've been bartending ever since probably the late 90s. Even while I was in the Marine Corps, I was bartending. It really subsidized my income, and I liked it. I was having a great time doing it. So... 2002, I'm back in Seattle. I started with bartending at Teeny Biggs, which is was a very popular bar in downtown Seattle and first in Denny. Um, this is back in the, the era of martinis and swing music and cigars. And uh, it was a great place to, 
to bartend. I was fortunate enough to win Seattle's best bartender there two years in a row, and I think oh five and oh six. Um, somebody can fact check me on that. It was through the Seattle Weekly, and then um, I eventually went up to Pesos Taco Lounge up on Queen Anne. Uh, by all means, probably the busiest bar in the city of Seattle for a, a solid decade for sure. And I worked uh, Thursday through Saturday nights, 13-hour shifts. Um, it was a heck of a good time. Um, but during my time of teeny bigs and pesos, I had a lot of cops that would come in to see me. And so for whatever reason, they saw something in me that they thought would um, make me be a good police officer. I wasn't really in the mood at the time to be a police officer. But in about 2013 or so, you know, I was 39 years old. Bartending was not as fun as it was when I was 27 years old. And I was looking for something a little bit different. And also, um, Seattle really wanted local people to be Seattle police officers. They were really trying to get Seattleites, people who live in the neighborhood, that community policing was really important to them. And the dissent decree had just started as well in 2013. So I applied in May thinking I was told it was going to probably take a couple of years for me to get hired. I applied in May and I was hired in July. And so uh, July, I think, 13th or 17th or something like that was my last bartending shift. And on August 1st, I left for the academy, a state-run academy down in Burien. I've uh, been a cop ever since. I love it. It's probably the highlight of my professional career. It turns out that I'm really good at it, too. Um, relative to the cops in general, I mean, I work with some of the most outstanding police officers there, there ever are going to be. So sometimes I'm humbled by how good they are. But we all bring different um, skill sets to the table. So it's nice to have a very eclectic team. And uh, right now, the community response group, the team that I'm on, is exactly that. Uh, it's about 20 officers, five sergeants, and one lieutenant. Um, I am right now based out of the West Precinct. However, my team is a citywide asset. So the West Precinct just houses us right now. Um, with that being said, about 60% of our work is usually in downtown Seattle just because it tends to have most of the problems uh, for the city. But uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the backstory. Yeah. Very cool. So one of the things I wanted to talk about too is to dive a little bit deeper into your law enforcement career. Mm -hmm. You haven't been able to do that so much is, you know, what do you think SPD is today? And, and you know, as, as long as I've been around, which has been a little bit, Seattle was always a tough place to be a cop. This was never an easy city to be in law enforcement. Yeah. It's changed a lot. You know, we're, we're having our challenges now. We've had them in the past. It's a river. It ebbs and flows. It cuts different directions. You know, what has your experience been as an officer in the last 10 years, and how do you think that fits historically into the city's experience? Yeah, like I said, I, I, I got hired when the dissent decree started, so I don't really know much of, you know, pre-dissent decree of what policing was like there. Other than, you know, you end up working with a lot of officers who have been around for a long time, and they'll certainly – you know, officers are great at telling stories. They really are a, a, a fun group to hang out with. If you ever get a chance to go be at a restaurant or go have dinner with a, a cop, they usually do have great stories once you crack that that shell. But yeah, uh, historically, Seattle has always been tough. I mean, especially when we were kind of a, a blue collar ship town, uh, we had a lot of a lot of wild stories. I mean, if you go into the Smith Tower, they have a lot about the Seattle Police Department in the the um, museum at the base of the Smith Tower. You know what what kind of a um, rum smuggling town this used to be and how kind of corrupt the Seattle Police Department was back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, obviously, in the 80s and 90s, things started changing, became way more global. Uh, I very much remember WTO. Uh, you know, I was bartending when that was going on and he, watching it on the news. That was It was pretty incredible. 2013, when I got hired, um, I did my first three years in patrol, so I really was a community police officer. I actually patrolled the area that I worked, so Pesos and Teeny Bigs are in, a, in an area called Queen 3 uh, is the beat for that, and I got that's what I got assigned on third watch, and so I worked only third watch, 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. I did that for about a year. Then I moved into downtown, a little bit more of the bar scene and, and a little bit more crime um, heavy in a, an area called Mary Sector, which is, you know, the heart of downtown Seattle. And really got to, you know, cut my teeth down there for two years doing patrol down there. I had one of the best squads. I, I had that dream squad of everybody got along. We, we all hung out off, uh, off duty. Uh, we'd go to each other's houses for dinner. We knew everybody's wives, husbands, kids. It was a, a really dream squad. I had a great sergeant. Sergeant Hockett was just fantastic to work for. 
Um, and then about three years in, uh, there was a group called the West Anti-Crime Team, which is within the Seattle Police Department's West Precinct. It's a proactive team. They do a lot of undercover work. And I was a little bit older. I was in my 40s by now, my early 40s. I got sent to the Anti-Crime Team School. Then, uh, you know, a bunch of other schools, surveillance schools, things of that nature, rifle school, and uh, was brought onto the West Act team full time. And I've been on there pretty much ever since. Uh, CRG is basically just a a reimagining of the ACT teams Um, during the 2020, 2021 uh, protests and riots. We obviously lost a lot of officers after that um, to the point where it was very difficult to even have ACT teams. I think we were down to, I want to say it was like three of us that were left and a sergeant. So they instead combined the ACT teams, called us the community response group, and made it citywide. So that's kind of how we got to the, the numbers we're at. We, we had much more uh, people for a while during the height of it, and we were really uh, so primarily dealing with uh, daily protests. You know, remember probably a year after George Floyd, we were still dealing with protests almost on a nightly basis, certainly a weekly basis. And so that was our primary job. But as that started to taper off, then we started going back to our roots, which is proactive policing and looking for crimes that are problems in different precincts. So, you know, the crimes that happen in the North Precinct are not necessarily the same crimes that are a problem in the South Precinct. And so we try to tailor um, our operations to them. Every single one of us is uh, responsible for coming up with different operations. And it's been, it's been incredibly rewarding um, to, to be given a problem that is a serious problem, such as, you know, a, a DV warrant suspect who has, you know, $750,000 worth of uh, warrants against him and finding out everything there is to know about his life, where he hangs out, where he sleeps, what he does, where he drives, is is really rewarding. And then to eventually take that person into custody and know that the victim actually has a day in court with this person, um, it's been really rewarding. It's been a fantastic career. But it has changed a lot just in the 10 years I've been on. I mean, just imagine 2013 to 2023, when we started out, we were at 1,300 officers. And that felt short. That felt like we were really down in numbers. Uh, Boston is a smaller geographic area. It is smaller in population, but has about 2,200 police officers. So to lose 500 officers over the last couple of years, 500 plus, and the the numbers change. It depends on if you ask the chief, the mayor, or the head of my union, uh, those numbers wiggle a little bit, but let's roughly say it's 500. Uh, I think we're, I think 800 is a safe number to say uh, plus or minus 50, but to only have 800 officers in this city, it's, it's tough. I mean, it is, it is tough. So a lot of times people go into SPD. I, I have some friends I went to high school with who then mm-hmm. got on. They'd go work Robert sector for a while, and then they'd lateral out. Yeah. Uh, go county, go something like that. Sure. You stayed. Ten years later, you seem to really love the job. What do you think has made your experience that that's made you want to stay in it? Steve, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> stupidity? I don't know. Uh, I only applied for Seattle Police Department. It was the only uh, department I wanted to be on. And oddly enough, I wanted to be a canine officer. I, that was my goal, to be a police officer, have a dog. You know, I've been grown up around hunting dogs my entire life, large breed dogs. That was my goal. And I've quarried with canine for quite a long time, probably seven, eight years. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, where canine is going is not where I want to go. I, I think I, I want to do more than what canine allows in the present environment with the laws and restrictions and the um, policies we have in place at the state, county, and city level and within my department. You know, it's very difficult to be a canine officer right now. And man, they do great work too. And they could even be doing more great work if they were given a little bit more uh, flexibility. So instead, I've been doing this proactive, a lot of undercover work the last seven years. And I live in downtown. I live across the street from the precinct. Uh, and like you said, I, I'm a little bit of a unicorn. I, I'm not married. I did the cop thing and got divorced about five years into my, um, police world. I'm still very good friends with my ex-wife. She owns a a business in, in downtown Seattle, very successful business on top of that. Um, but I don't have any kids and I have the time and the flexibility to do a lot of things within the the department that not everybody has the time to do. So my experience is not the, the typical experience by any stretch. I will say I I give so much props to the men and women who do what I do and live 
an hour, hour and a half outside the city who have significant others, who have kids and baseball teams and soccer leagues and travel and, and like all the things that normal families have. They're doing that while working as a downtown Seattle police officer, especially in my unit, a proactive unit where you're basically required to work a lot of overtime. It blows my mind, you know, when we're getting off work at four in the morning and we are all just dragging, I've got to walk across the street <laughs> and go to bed. And I've got folks that have to drive hour, hour and a half home. And then maybe we have a, a quick turnaround. We got to be back at, you know, seven, eight, nine in the morning and they've got to do the same thing over. Now, during the height of it all, it wasn't uncommon for me to take everybody's uniforms and throw them in a bag and then just take them over to my house and I'd wash everybody's uniforms and then bring them back the next day just to try to like help my teammates out a little bit. But uh, my experience with the Seattle Police Department has been 98% positive. Um, I love, love the department. Um, when Lexi Harris uh, was killed on the freeway a couple years ago, it was probably the toughest thing I've had to deal with as a Seattle police officer. But I will say I had never been more proud of the Seattle Police Department during that, that time. They really stepped up. They, they showed what kind of family this is and how tight they were around us all. So um, I, I will never leave this department unless it's to go do city council or something like that. I would never leave this department to go to another agency. I understand why people do it. Just for me, this is my home. These are my people. And this city is my city. I mean, I, I love listening to people from Boston and uh, New York. You know, I've been in New York one time. I've never been to Boston. But, man, they are so proud of their city. Yeah. They're, they will tell you exactly where they're from, you know, what street they're from. And, man, if you smack talk their city, you, you, better, <laughs> you better be prepared. Uh, I wish Seattle was a little bit more that way. I wish people had a little bit more pride in the city. I wish that um, I wish my teammates had the opportunity to see and to enjoy the city the way I get to enjoy the city. Because when they leave and they go off to Lake Stevens or Bonnie Lake or wherever they they live, you know I get to go out at night. You know I get to go to Flint Creek and Rock Creek, and Republic, and and you know see locals and and see my old restaurant friends and listen to great music and. Um, I don't think there's any going back, but I would like to see us go forward and, and build this like really cool community again um, that feels more livable than it does right now. So let's talk about this transition. So you've had really, by all accounts, a successful career or in a successful career. Yeah. Continuing to advance forward. And now you want to take a run at changing things up, probably would experience a pay cut in doing so, a very different lifestyle, a yeah. lot of scrutiny you may have not had in the past. What has you wanting to do this? Why now? Why at this time in your life? Why this? Steve, maybe somebody should check me for like a tra traumatic brain injury or something <laughs> like that. Because uh, <laughs> the way you made that sound, yeah, that's a pretty foolish move. Um, I, I didn't have any childhood dream of being a police officer. I went on a few ride-alongs in high school. Um, one of my family friends, uh, or two of our family friends were police officers. And, I, and it was fun, you know, I mean. Copping is kind of cool. It's like they make a lot of movies about cops. But I didn't really have any ambition of like getting back in a uniform and doing this. It turns out I really, really like it. And I, I, I wouldn't say I like it. I love this job. But four years ago when, uh, when Andrew Lewis was running against Jim Pugil, you know, I, I paid close attention to that election. It was, it was positive at the first part where they said, hey, we need to hire more police officers. Okay, yeah, I can get behind that. You know, I wasn't a big fan of Andrew Lewis back then because, um, oddly enough, I had uh, heard of him a little bit through the city prosecutor's office. You know, he worked for Pete Holmes. And at the time, Pete Holmes and the prosecuting office weren't really doing their jobs. They, they weren't sending very many of our misdemeanor and gross misdemeanor cases through. They would largely plea them out, which you, there is an argument for that. You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't plea things. But being the only thing you do or the basic thing you do, eventually you have to go to trial. Eventually you do have to hold some people accountable. And I understand that misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors can oftentimes get overlooked by the media and by society. You know, you break somebody's store window and, you know, that's not going to make the news. But some store owner had to pay for that, you know. Uh, if, you're, if you're getting by on a restaurant and, you know, listen, the 
the profit margins on a restaurant are, are slight, and sometimes they're in the, the, the red. And somebody comes along and breaks your $3,000 window. Now, granted, technically that's a felony. Anything over $750 is a felony, but we don't file that, that way very often. So a lot of times it'll get put to the city. And to not hold that person accountable, what messages does that send? Now, I'm not a big fan of Mayor Giuliani. Never have been. But that broken window theory was true, you know, and I'm sure he didn't come up with it. I'm sure somebody else came up with that way before him. But it bothered us as police officers to, you know, try to go and deal with some of these very smaller misdemeanors and not have them go anywhere. So he was already on my radar when he was running before he ran. And then when he ran, um, I was disappointed that he won. I thought Jim Pugil was just a better, better choice. And, you know, we can go into the details of his tactics that he used and um, certainly some controversy. But Andrew Lewis is who we got. So let's move forward and try to make the best of it, especially if he said he was hiring more police officers and seemed to be pro-public safety. Um, you would assume that somebody who is a prosecutor would be pro-public safety. I and mean, that's the theory, right, is if – if you're not pro public safety, maybe you should be a defense attorney because that seems to be more uh, along those lines. I don't know when that flipped that people that don't want to have public safety all of a sudden became prosecutors. So um, we watched him pretty closely. Uh, I watched him probably closer than most. Uh, after George Floyd happened, uh, obviously it's no secret that he was at Chaz Chop taking selfies with a bunch of other city council members. Um, we had to go to his house on several occasions because people were protesting outside of all the council, uh, their different homes. And his was no different. He lives on Queen Anne. Certainly not going to give his address up. But we had to go to his house to, you know, basically protect him, make sure that it didn't get out of, out of control. And it was usually between 20, 25 people that would show up. And, yeah, they were annoying. And they had bullhorns, and they said a lot of mean things about him. And as we've come to find out, Andrew Lewis doesn't take those very well, that he he's very easily intimidated. And so he would come out in, in his, you know, from his house and address the crowd. And this is during COVID, so you know, he's wearing a mask and we're outside. And he'd tell them in front of the police department that they're there to protect him. Yes, I am in fact going to defund the police by 50%. That I am on board with that. That's gonna, you know. <laughs> it's going to be a problem for the police department when you tell us to our faces, you know, that yes, these guys, they're not going to even be here in a couple years. So certainly didn't do himself any favors. Then he moved on and co-sponsored two uh, repeals. One was drug traffic loitering. Uh, we refer to it as DTL. Um, basically the idea is that if you're a drug dealer and you've done a certain amount of hand-to-hand -hand transactions in a certain amount of time in a certain geographic area, it gives us probable cause to go contact you. Now, it won't always necessarily be an arrest. Um, we certainly have that legal authority, lawful purpose. But every now and then, every now and then, it would be something smaller. Like, you know, we legalized weed. So weed has a little bit of a black market in downtown Seattle because it's so heavily taxed that some people just don't want to go to a dispensary and, you know, give up their ID and have to pay $100 for a joint or whatever, you know, $25 for a joint. So, so there is a little bit of a, a market in, um, in the downtown area for weed, especially if you're under 18 or under 21. Uh, so every now and then you'd see the hand of hands, you see the money exchange, you'd see the packaging and it, it would be marijuana. So, while that still is illegal, uh, we obviously don't treat it too seriously. And um, But 99 times out of 100, it wasn't marijuana. 99 times out of 100, it was heroin, meth, um, crack, things of that nature. So he took that tool away from us because he said we were only going after young men in hoodies. Incredibly insulting. You know, anybody, I can bring anybody out to the 1500 block of 3 Avenue, especially now. And they can point out the drug dealers to me. Having no experience in law enforcement, they can tell me who's the drug dealer, which it, that's how obvious and open air it is. The other thing that he took away was something called prostitution loitering. And prostitution loitering was kind of the same concept. If you have contacted a certain amount of cars in a certain amount of time, in a certain amount of geographical area, 
we can contact you. We have probable cause to contact you. Now, in all my years, 10 years, I've never arrested a prostitute for straight prostitution. Um, what we used it as, especially if they looked like they were underage, was a opportunity to contact the prostitute and the driver because they're both committing the illegal act of solicitation of a prostitution. But by taking away prostitution loitering from us, it is very difficult to go contact the girls. And like I said, a lot of times we were trying to take these girls into protective custody because they're not going to say something in front of their pimp. You know, they're not going to say something in front of the other girls. But sometimes when we get them back to um, the precinct or just even area that's not on the track, you get different answers. You, you get to find out things that you normally wouldn't be able to find out. So he took that away. And the reason he took it away was he said we were only going after women in short skirts. Yet again, a very insulting thing to say. And these are, these are tweets. I mean, he put these on Seattle uh, public record. They were, on the, they were on the website. I ended up snapping them and making sure that, that I memorialized them because I was so insulted over the whole thing. So I ask you now, what does drugs look like in downtown Seattle and drug dealing? What does prostitution look like on Aurora Avenue North and the girls and what they're wearing up there? You know, it's gotten to the point now where I'm embarrassed for the city. I really am. Oddly enough, the worst time of the day to go up and see Aurora Avenue North is at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. Yes. That is because they know that people just got paid on Friday and that the Johns can call their wives or significant others and say they're at work all day when, in fact, they are doing illegal activity with the girls or whomever up there all day on Friday. So... Oddly enough, Fridays are our busiest day for in the morning of uh, dealing with and, and trying to do something about prostitution up on Aurora Avenue North. Now, Aurora Avenue North is not my district, but still, being a city council person, I want people to know that I understand what's going on in the entire city. You know, the problems of Alki and the problems of Rainier Beach, the problems of Aurora Avenue North are my problems as well because we've already seen some of the effects of the things we do in downtown spreading out to other areas. You'll see, you note that the, some of the homeless encampments in downtown have moved away. You know, they used to be under like the old Macy's, you know, that whole strip of like fourth Avenue, I believe that's a 1600 block of fourth Avenue. They're not there anymore. They, they haven't been for, you know, well over a year now, but now you have areas. I have friends that are calling me from like the Arboretum and they're like, what is going on? We have like tent encampments everywhere. You know, now you see them up and down the freeway all over again. It made the old version of the jungle, which, you know, if you're unaware what the jungle is, that was what the area would be called underneath I-5 that there were hundreds and hundreds of homeless people living in. Now that that jungle has exploded. You know, it is it is from Everett to Tacoma along the I-5 corridor. So it's getting worse. Um, but like you said, I'm an optimist. I mean, I, I have seen change happen rapidly if the, there's the political will to do it. So um, my experience in downtown, the experience of what I do as a police officer versus the other candidates is is very different. So one of the things I, I wanted to talk to you about is uh, in Se- Seattle, there is an affordable housing issue. I think we all acknowledge that there is, but do you think that the homeless issue and affordable housing are the same issue or what are the drivers that are making those two things happen? Yeah. Um, we definitely have an affordable housing issue for sure. Uh, being a renter, I, I see it all the time. It's very difficult to see what inventory we have, what is available, what isn't available. I think some of the going rates, uh, there's some collusion going on in terms of, uh, and I know it's on the commercial side because I've spoken to a lot of commercial real estate agents that there's just a certain dollar per square foot that people want to get to make sure that they're making steady money. And if it means that we leave these spaces vacant for a while, Mm -hmm. so be it. You know, there's spaces right across the street from a call hall right now that that brand new space has been open for four years that still haven't been filled because they just refuse to come down on the dollar per square foot. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't know who's subsidizing that kind of, you know, four years. That's, that's a long time to go without anybody in there. But when it comes to the homelessness crisis and affordable housing, they are not, they're not as related as the media and some of the loudest voices talking about them make them out to be. There's a, Michael Schellenberger wrote a 
pretty famous book called San Francisco. I don't know why he's controversial at all. He's actually was a Democrat. He was, uh, I think, part of uh, not the peacekeepers, uh, Peace Corps. He was part of Peace Corps in his early years. Uh, staunch environmentalist. I mean, he, he comes his his background is very Berkeley esque. In fact, I think he went to Berkeley. Uh, very liberal, very progressive. And he has written this book called San Francisco, and it talks about the homelessness crisis in San Francisco. Somebody I would love to bring up to Seattle and have him uh, speak to the city council in Seattle about his research and where he thinks we're going and what we could be doing better. But the premise of the book is that um, the days of Hooverville in the 1920s, the days of these chronic homeless camps, is not what we're seeing now. And and I know this is true as a police officer because he was basically affirming what I already knew, but I think he articulated it far better than I did. So I'm, I'm using a little bit of his book to um, come up with this theory that I have. These are not open, these are not encampments like we, we think they are, you know, of just a, a whole bunch of people that, you know, I used to be a Boeing machinist and lost my job and, you know, a few paychecks later, a few rent checks later, boom, I'm homeless. These are open-air drug camps. These are open-air drug markets. What has happened is that about 80 to 90% of them, over a period of time, got addicted to some form of narcotics, whether it be fentanyl, meth, heroin a while ago. I don't think that's as nearly as popular as it was, but some opioid. And they've burned through their entire savings, You know everything that used to be normal to them, They've probably slept on every family member's couch that would let them do that, every friend's couch that would let them do that, and eventually burned so many bridges that at some point or another, people had had enough, and they no longer had an opportunity to be housed. So that unhoused part is a correct way to describe them. Eventually, they got into a city that, like Seattle, where drugs are pretty much legalized here. I mean, you know, you can do almost any drug you want in Seattle, and there's really not any repercussions for you. These encampments are areas where you can go do drugs. You know, they're like opium dens. You go buy the drugs. You, you don't even have to leave. You just use the drugs right there. You pass out almost anywhere you want and get in that zombie-like state that you're in, and you just end up staying there. And there are a lot of encampments that we do surveillance on because a lot of drug dealers deal drugs there. And a lot of drug dealers are in the encampments and they don't necessarily need to be, but this is where the business is. And so I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours watching these encampments um, for the lawful purpose of, of finding out who's dealing, what kind of crimes are happening in there. But some of them are so dangerous that we can't even go in there, you know, as individual police officers, we usually end up having a squad go in there. Sometimes we send our SWAT team in there because they're so dangerous. But during that time, especially in the wintertime, which is the absolute worst, is you have some of the most horrid conditions I have ever seen anywhere. I was in the Marine Corps. I never saw anything like that in the Marine Corps. You have the darkest, wettest, muddiest, dirtiest environment you can possibly imagine with mice and rats and possums and stray cats, lice, scabies, infestations of every sort in there. Um feces, you know, piss, it just everything that is in there is not something you'd want to live on and certainly not lay down in. And we just allow this. And they are tents that are filled full of stolen products, you know, people's generators, copper. You want to know where your stolen bike went? It's probably in an encampment. Uh, stolen cars, certainly guns. And 99% of them are stolen. You know, they weren't bought in a legal manner and then brought into an encampment. The crime, every imaginable crime, the worst crimes you can imagine from homicide to rape, sexual assault, assault, theft, organized retail theft. All of those crimes happen every single day in these encampments. It would break your heart how many bodies we found in these encampments. And it's not necessarily in your mind the body you think you're going to find. Not that, that old guy who just couldn't make it through another winter. You know, these are young people. These are sometimes teenagers. 
These are people, certainly women, these are people that just were in the worst throes of some physical, emotional, chemical crisis and were taken advantage of. Some of them were just left to die. You know, uh, somebody else was as high as that person was, but one OD'd and the other one wasn't capable of calling 911. And they just died by themselves in a cold, dark, wet, dirty camp. So the thought that we just keep allowing this to happen and the thought that the solution is to just build more homes, these folks aren't ready for homes. Um, I did an event probably two weeks ago at the Belltown United uh, in downtown, obviously very upsetting after 4th and Lenora and that pregnant woman uh, being shot and killed along with her unborn child. And the first half was, you know, uh, the captain of the West Precinct and uh, Andrew Lewis was there, Sarah Nelson was there, Ann Davidson, um, King County Prosecutor's Office, uh, maybe a few other people. They were the first panel. And, you know, Sarah Nelson by far did the best. You know, she, she she's somebody that I, I really look forward to if I get elected working with. I think her and I see eye to eye on a lot of things. We certainly don't see eye to eye on everything like maybe on the political spectrum, but certainly when it comes to the city hall and city of Seattle, her and I are pretty closely aligned. Andrew Lewis, man, just, just politicianed his way through the whole, like, you know, people obviously ask him questions, you know, why did you not criminalize drugs? And he gave the same, you know, stupid answers he always does about how it's just not right. The timing isn't right. Somehow we can still use the prosec- the King County prosecutor's office with the King County prosecutor, sitting, you know, three seats away from shaking her head. No, that no, that's not the way that's going to work. We already talked about this. And yet you're not being truthful on this, this stage in this platform. Sarah Nelson did a really good job of not calling Andrew Lewis out to his face, but basically pointing out the fact that since June 6, when that law did not get passed, and this was roughly mid July, that statistically probably 50 to 70 people have overdosed and died in downtown Seattle on fentanyl. Is it directly Andrew Lewis's fault? By no means. But does that have something to do with it? Yeah, absolutely it does. And the the fact that we keep allowing open-air drug activity and people to just do fentanyl wherever they want and meth wherever they want, we're adding to the problem. We're condoning and legislating people to die. And so this idea that we're going to build houses, enough houses for them, um, oh, the point of that was there was um, a second group of people panelists after they left. So, you know, the first group left, most of the news left with them. And the second group were all social workers and psychologists and experts in their field. And they were by by far more articulate about what we should be doing, where we should be going and the problems that we're facing. And of the two or 300 people that started, there was maybe 75 of us left listening to these folks. And they were by far better at, um, addressing the problem and coming up with some solutions. And one of the panelists uh, at the very end, and I believe he worked for uh, We Heart Seattle. I'm guessing at some point in his life had an addiction as well because he spoke so well about the subject matter. And he said something that I've been talking about quite a long time just through the fact that I get to talk to folks who are suffering from addiction all the time in my everyday job. In that... You have to make somebody housing ready first. You can't just throw somebody into a house. You know, you can't build them a brand new studio apartment and open the, open the door, give them the keys and say, here you go. Good luck. When they're still in the throes of addiction, when their mental illness is coming through, probably the addiction that they're suffering, if they didn't already have some beforehand when they're just not ready to deal with the idea of some of the responsibilities that having a home requires, you know, turning on and off the lights, making sure that your toilets don't get clogged. And these seem like simple things, like I'm being um, dismissive about. These are things that we deal with all the time. Like, you know, the Morrison gets flooded quite a bit because somebody has clogged their toilet and it is now flown into like three stories of housing. Um, because somebody has passed out and, and not paying attention to anything that's going on in their lives. So like I said, he had a great point. These We need to get people housing ready first. But I also agree, oddly enough, with some of the court decisions, is that I don't think the idea of just sweeping people and making them move from place to place to place is effective. I mean, I've seen it last, certainly the last four years. I mean, it's it's tough on these folks. 
I absolutely acknowledge that being told to pick up all of your stuff and move, even though you were given options, you know, it's not like we just came through and just out of nowhere showed up at eight o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday and said, you got to move. These folks have had weeks of outreach, absolute weeks of outreach, and they have decided not to take any of it. Now, part of it, I get on their side, you know, some of the shelters, they're not very clean. They're not very safe. Um, if you are a young person who is slight of size and stature, you can get manipulated and taken advantage of. If you're an old person who is slight of stature, you can get manipulated and taken advantage of. If you're just somebody who's not even not on drugs or mentally ill, they're difficult places to be in. I mean, they're loud, they're dirty. I mean, you could be trying to you know, sleep in a bunk bed and have somebody in the throes of a psychotic episode above you screaming at the top of your lung, their lungs all night long. I mean, these, these aren't really great places to, to hang out. And, you know, I hate to just throw DESC under the the bus because they are really doing, they're trying to do really good work, but there's a lot of places that are like that. Now, some of them are a little more strict, like the Salvation Army, their shelter, they're a little more strict about who they allow in there and who they don't. And then, you know, if you're allowed to stay, if you're being disruptive or you've committed some kind of crime in there, they're a little bit more strict. DSC is a little bit more open, but they still have, you know, we'll contact somebody that says, yeah, I'm not, I'm barred from DSC. I can't go in there anymore. So I understand why the homeless sometimes don't want to come out of their tent where they're allowed to do drugs. They can steal whatever they want. They can usually find a good meal because there's a lot of opportunities to eat here in the city of Seattle. We have a lot of great people that are doing the Lord's work by feeding folks. Um, great, warm, nutritious meals, especially in the wintertime. But there's nothing that forces them out of those tents. There's nothing that forces them to get off of 12th and Jackson or 12th and King and move into a shelter. So if we provided them clean, safe shelters that were monitored 24 hours a day by some form of law enforcement, by some form of the fire department, by some form of social workers, and then we had daily, if not, you know, weekly for sure, uh, medical uh, you know, a mobile medical unit that could come around and make sure that their abscesses are getting taken care of, that there are any kind of medical issues that are like severe, certainly need to be addressed. And we spread that throughout the city where these clean, safe shelters are places we know we can put somebody. And we have the public involved too. You know, before we open any of them, we open them to the public so they can tour them. Do they feel safe that they're, you know, they're okay with that, that NIMBY attitude, not in my backyard, that, if they had a son or daughter, an aunt or uncle that was in the throes of addiction or mental illness, would they feel okay with them going in there and, and being in there? Now, these aren't meant to be long-term. Uh, you know, it, it bothers me when I see people in there for more than a year. There's, there's no reason you should be living in a tiny house for more than a year. Something has broken down in the system that you're either not getting the help you need or the help that we're providing you is not enough to get you to the next level. Because to me, after a year... We should be looking for more permanent housing for you. Um, And that's where I'll work with other people. If the idea of more housing includes people that are housing ready to go into them, then absolutely. But until we get to that stage, I don't understand the philosophy of just build it and we'll we'll just put them in there. Because this is the United States of America. You can move anywhere you want. Who's to say that Montana, Idaho, Oregon, wherever, start sending their folks to Seattle like, They've got plenty of housing out there. Go out to Seattle. They'll they'll buy it for you. They'll yeah. rent is basically free. The problem I think has gotten so large in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles is because they are known for areas for the rest of the country to come to and do drugs, live however you want. There are enough resources that when you're hungry or you do need some assistance, it's there for you. I would say probably right now. Six in 10 people that I contact as a police officer aren't even from Seattle. They're usually not even from the state of Washington, right. and they've, they've come into this area. Now, I don't know if they were actually given a bus ticket and sent on a, on a Greyhound and said, hey, go to Seattle and don't ever come back to wherever, because sometimes they'll have a warrant. They'll have a, usually a chippy warrant out of some state, and we refer to those as a don't come back to Montana warrant. So it's like 500 bucks. Montana will not, you know... Uh, not run the warrant. They won't verify the warrant for us, which basically means, okay, we can't send them back to Montana. It's non-extraditable, but at some point or another, they made their way out of Montana. And I'm not just blaming Montana. This has happened. I mean, we have East coast states that somehow these folks are making it out to Washington, you know, West Virginia and 
place. You're like, how did you get out to Seattle in your state? You know, like your physical state, your mental state, like holy, you know, I just had a, a SWAT buddy of mine said he was down in uh, Austin doing a school down there. And one of our regulars that him and I knew very well in downtown was down in Austin. He's like, bro, how did you get down to Austin, Texas? He's like, it took a long time. Me and my girlfriend eventually made it down here. It was like, wow, okay. <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. How So <clears throat> a few different ways you could go about it. You could go out and let's enforce all the crime and arrest everybody. There's off-ramp options where you get into programs. But what, what are some of the other limiters that we may not know about if you could yeah. if gloves are off tomorrow clean the streets do you even have jail cells to use is there is is the whole supply chain there to even process the next steps how does that work? yeah let's even um take it one step backwards first mm-hmm. it's been really remarkable while running for city council is um <laughs> if i had a dollar for every time somebody told me you know what you should do mm-hmm. i'd be a rich richer man um i tell people these are ideas that i have some of them have not been tested. Um, some of them are learned through my job as a police officer that I think that I think would work better. Some of them are things that I've read about in other areas that I think would be practical in Seattle that we could make be take to scale. But ultimately, I have to convince at least four other people in the city council that this is the way to go. And then I have to convince the mayor's office that this is the way to go. Or I convince a super majority in the city council this is the way to go, and then the mayor just kind of has to follow along because we have, you know, six or more city council people that are behind a platform or a, uh, a tactic that we're going to try to use. So I certainly can't wave a magic wand and just say, this is, this is what we're going to do right here. With that being said, um, you know, I think some of the principles that need to be followed, we'll, so, we'll certainly never be able to rest our way out of this. This is not... And I don't think anybody's advocating for that. I, it's unfortunate that it gets brought up a lot. You know, you can't arrest your way out of this. Yeah, I think everybody knows we can't arrest our way out of it. Of course, there's not enough space in King County, nor would King County even be amenable to that. I mean, they're, they're dealing with their own problems. I mean, some of the issues we're going to have is not only the city, is we, we have to work with a county that might not necessarily be in line with us. Certainly, the state legislature does not seem like it's in line with us. Those three entities are... Um, they all control a big piece of this pie. I mean, Seattle is a, a you know, thank goodness we're not a, a small little town, a smaller town, because, you know, I think probably some of the issues that Everett has and some of the issues that even Tacoma, which is still decent, certainly a city. Uh, Seattle, thank goodness, is the largest city with the largest budget, and we have a lot more resources and probably a little more sway in this county and state. But with that being said, we still need to go work closely with the county, you know, um, their budget is roughly double our budget. And then the state, you know, they hold really the purse strings more so than the, the city or the state does or the county does. So we do have to work hand in hand, try to influence them. Hopefully we have enough people on city council that we can create little coalitions. Hopefully we have uh, the bully pulpit where we can really talk to people and the voters and get them to call their King County legislators or their council people, call their state legislators to try to move the ball a little bit in directions that we need to move the ball. With that being said, I'd really like to focus on police for sure. Um, you know, that is a third of the prong of trying to move forward is having effective policing, enough of them to go around, but effective policing. I would like to see professional um, social workers and psychologists that are available to assess every single person that are out on the street. And then third, we just really have to have good um, effective parole afterwards. So we're not just releasing people onto the streets without any kind of like plan or follow up. So that that psychologist or social worker also needs to, you know, has to have good case management where they're not just getting overwhelmed. But when we release somebody from the King County Jail, there's a plan that we're not just kicking them out to Third or Fourth Avenue to a drug infested area where they can go find drugs and they can go get into trouble or they can, you know, do the vices that they were in jail for in the first place. That is the pl- my plan going forward and how I think I can convince the rest of the city council that this is the way to go forward. Um, I'm open to a lot of programs. Uh, I don't think some of the programs we have right now are very effective, and it's mostly just because they've never shown metrics of their success. 
and that's been some of my harshest criticism of them is I like where your headspace is at. I think that, you know, your idea is great, uh, especially listening to that panel at Belltown United. I thought Reach, you know, seemed like a very good program that, that they seem to, you know, be moving in the right direction and doing the right things. But the fact that all of them are kind of worried about metrics of success, like how do we show that somebody graduated? How do we show that, you know, the money that you are giving us is being used effectively is difficult. And they're also in a difficult situation, you know, um, just graduated college and you're a social worker making $45,000 a year trying to live in downtown Seattle and you have a caseload of 300 clients, you're probably not going to have a great success rate. You know, that's, that's going to be a problem. So paying them what they should be paid as a professional, but also making sure that their caseload is something that is actual, actually doable but also making sure that they have the power to hold their clients accountable. And, and at the end, you know, report to their bosses, okay, this is how many people we have in rehab. This is how many people we have in shelters. This is how many people we have in temporary housing. This is how many people we have in permanent housing, you know. And, and listen, tell me the bad things. I understand there's going to be relapses. It absolutely, fentanyl is one of the most addictive drugs that has ever hit the streets of Seattle. And now we have extra things on top of that. We have additives added to the fentanyl that make it even worse. We have trank, we have carfentanyl, which is a, a veterinary grade opioid. So yeah, we're going to have fallbacks. People are going to go into relapse. I fully expect that anybody on the city council should fully expect that, that there is no silver bullet. We're going to get everybody on methadone and you know, everybody's just going to be a kumbaya moment. I have oftentimes said that this problem is you know, or it gets compared to cancer. Like we have cancer in the street of Seattle. It's cancer of drugs. And I don't think that's a really good analogy. I think the closer analogy would be more like um, somebody who's a burn patient, you know, whether it be self-inflicted or an accident, um, their body is burned. And the treatment for a burn patient is incredibly difficult. It's obviously horrifying for the person who is burned and, and getting the treatment and the first aid and the medical care they need. But it's also tough for the people that are giving it to them. The idea of scrubbing somebody's infected burns away with, you know, pads that hurt and probably cause a pain that you and I have never experienced before. But that is the method in order to get them, maybe not to where they were before, but certainly well. That's going to save their life. And they're screaming and hollering, just, let, just leave me alone. Just don't touch me anymore. Don't do this. It hurts. You're, you're hurting me. And for that pr provider to be compassionate, but also ignore those, those cries because they know that the method to save them is this method. It is this path to get, make sure that their, their wounds have clean dressings on them and that fresh dressings are constantly applied. And it's going to be a long path and it's going to be difficult, but eventually we're going to get you to a place where you're as functioning as we can possibly medically make you. Mm -hmm. And we have the support network here for you spiritually, emotionally, and you've had the best care and treatment we can give you with the resources that we have available. And they were done by people that really do care about you and they do want you to get better. Your family wants you to get better. Your friends want you to get better. Your society and citizens want you to get better. Um, I have yet to see too many people. I was, I was going to say nobody, but I actually have had, unfortunately, a few people say this. Everybody wants kind of the same thing. We, we don't want homeless anymore. We don't want people sleeping in the streets. Is there a time that we'll ever have no homeless? I doubt it. I mean, there's just, there's a certain amount of freedom you have as, as a citizen to say, listen, I just don't want to follow your rules and I don't want to do your thing. I want to sleep out in the woods uh, or I want to sleep in my car. Or, you know, I found this dilapidated RV. You can probably do that. My point is, in the city of Seattle, I don't think we should allow that. That we should have laws and mechanisms to support these folks. That it's not just a matter of arresting them and sending them to jail. You have choices. You cannot put your tent up in Denny Park. A park that is owned by the city of Seattle, by the public of Seattle, by the citizens of Seattle, and take over Denny Park. Now, your choices are you can go to this shelter... We can try to get you into these programs. We can try to get you some temporary housing. 
But ultimately, if you decide that you're not willing to do any of those things, you either need to move on somewhere else that allows this, or the alternative is eventually you're going to go to jail. So we offered him a whole lot of carrot, but there is a little bit of stick, and you have to have that because there's nothing to hold that person accountable. Eventually, if they keep telling you to pound sand, you know, what do you do next? You know, if they refuse to, to move on and they refuse to take any of the programs, what's the next plan? So for the city of Seattle, I think we have an opportunity to um, really start something that hopefully other cities will follow. Hopefully the county will follow and hopefully we can work collaboratively together to get some of these situations under control. Tell me about Mayor Bruce Harold. What are your thoughts on him? He still seems to be in a honeymoon period to me, even though he's been here for a while. It's interesting to me how the, the media's how the media's treated him, how the yeah. public's treated him. He hasn't had a scandal, nothing like that. But no. um, he's been in this for a little bit, and not a whole lot's changed, but he's very optimistic. Yes. He seems to have a lot of public trust. Yes. And public leaders' trust. Yes. What are your thoughts? Um, I will be slightly careful with my answer just because uh, he is my boss's 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 <laughs> boss. <Yeah. laughs> uh, you know, he's he's the, really the head of the police department that everybody thinks the chief is. But, you know, the chief works for the mayor and the mayor hires the chief. So um, I would say this to him, to his face. Uh, I like him very much. I think he is the Joe Biden of Seattle. Mm. Now, Democrats will think, wow, that's quite the compliment and Republicans will be like, Oh man, that was burn. It's not, he's the Joe Biden without the dementia. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that he's losing his marbles. Like poor Joe is. Um, he is been around for a long time. You know, he was in the city council for more than a decade before he became mayor. And I think he left the city council, not because he wanted to leave city council. I think he thought he was going to lose in a primary mm -hmm. and just stepped away and said, all right, listen, enjoy. Um, he seems to have had a pretty great life. I mean, um, talking to him and l listening to his body, not talking to him, we haven't had a conversation, but just hearing him talk um, and, you know, kind of seeing his bio, he, he seems to have had a pretty great life and he still continues to, see, to have a pretty great life uh, through hard work that him and his wife and his family have done. He is very popular considering how unpopular our last few mayors have been before him, his, his predecessors. Uh, I really wish he used more of his popularity and his political capital that he has right now to push some things forward harder than he has. Yeah. I don't know what the thought was when that criminalizing drugs, why he didn't step up and, and take more of a, a leadership role. I mean, you are the mayor, and I understand that the, the city council is effectively the second, you know, the judicial branch of the, the government and you're the executive branch. However, it's not unprecedented to have the president of the United States or the governor of a state step up when there's a controversial bill in front of a body like that and take a stance and really, once again, use the bully pulpit of your, um, of your position to, to force something through. So in my mind, and this might be naive of me because I have never run for politics before, in that city council chamber, when Andrew Lewis was, you know, about ready to like knock out those crocodile tears and really like just have that moment where 20 people are yelling at me and I don't know what to do. And I was going to vote this way, but now I'm going to vote this way. Imagine if the mayor was sitting in, not on the panel, just in the crowd, just sitting there, like looking at the city council. Or maybe he even said something before or said something right after. That would have had, I think, a powerful leadership role, a powerful effect on what might have happened. Um, London Bree out of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I'm probably not a big fan of hers for a long time. I mean, I think San Francisco is exactly what I'm trying to avoid Seattle become. But I don't know if you saw like, gosh, what was it, three, four weeks ago? There was a council person uh, who... Uh, not that his age, sex, or color should matter, but we'll call it as we see it. He was a middle-aged or older white guy uh, who's on the city council and was trying to tell the female black mayor of how drugs work and the fact that um, we should not be criminalizing drugs in the city of San Francisco. And she let him 
speak his mind, and he had used some people in uh, their public health as examples of why they should legalize these deadly drugs. And she went off on him in the public. Mm-hmm. On this, you know, I don't know how their their government works exactly because it looked like they were in the kind of the same room. Like it almost looked like parliament. Like she was like in the center, and then there was two rows on the side. Um, but she gave him both barrels for a good three to five minutes about how people are dying, how she's had friends die, how she's had friends' kids die due to fentanyl and opioid addiction. And I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was one of the most, I mean, kind of gives me chills just thinking about it right now. I thought it was that kind of leadership. Like I said, I don't agree with probably 90% of her proposals or what she's done with San Francisco. But that would have been really cool to see Mayor Harrell do the same thing of really come out. So we've moved forward. Apparently there's a 24 person panel that has just been discussing this. I have no idea why it takes this long. Um, I'm sure Andrew Lewis is chomping at the bit to get something passed. I mean, please Lord pass something before August 1st, because I think this, I think he was already in really precarious ground before August 1st, but this might've just sealed his, his fate of voting no against criminalizing fentanyl and meth um but overall yeah i think i think bruce harrell is somebody i'd love to work with um i wish i knew a little bit more about the inner workings of of the mayor's office i'm kind of curious what happened with his niece leaving and why she left and where the 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 challenges they were having um amongst themselves um yeah i look forward to working with them i i think that sometimes being somebody who is opinionated like myself, you know, we can get easily pigeonholed into this idea that we're, oh, we wouldn't work with each other. We're, you know, we wouldn't be very good partners. Man, you can't do any of this stuff without good partnership um, within the police department, within all the public safety sector, certainly within government at the highest levels. You have to be a good partner. You have to be able to work with these folks. And, and Mayor Harrell is absolutely somebody I think I could work with. And I think, in my opinion, Um, between Mayor Durkin and every mayor before her, this one seems like the best. But he's he's not without his detractions in that I think some of the reasons we're in the issues we're having is because he was part of a city council that that was a certain way for a certain period of time and kind of got us here. Been intrigued. I don't know what he does behind the scenes, but they don't really challenge him like they've challenged previous mayors. He seems to have... A lot of even if they don't agree with what he's doing, they seem to not publicly go out in contrast against him. He seems to have some quiet support. Yeah, I mean that's an excellent point. Uh, and I have friends in downtown. Um, you know, I have friends that absolutely adore him, yeah. love him, and sometimes I I'm kind of surprised at how, how much they like him. Like you know, they have this real sense that things are getting better, which sometimes they are. I think they're certainly getting better during the daytime hours. Um, you know, having Amazon back even though it's only three days a week, you know, it feels like the city's more thriving. Now we're also in the summertime. So summertime is a catch 22. You know, it's, it's beautiful out. I mean, Seattle, what is it, like 72 degrees today? It's like, <laughs> we've had the most beautiful summer. Of course, I haven't got to enjoy any of it because I've just been <laughs> running the entire summer. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, the city just is a fantastic place to be right now. <laughs> it's just, it doesn't get any better than this. Um, but with the summertime also comes a, a spike in crime. I mean, the fact that we're having a violent summer is nothing new. Now, granted, this might be the most violent summer I've seen in a long time, but that's nothing new. I mean, every summer, I think I've been on some form of a task force or some form of a violent unit, you know, counter violence unit my entire, certainly the last seven years, every summer. This is just, this is the cycle. It's unfortunate. It's a seasonal business. It just can be a seasonal <laughs> business. But yeah, like I said, some of my friends just absolutely adore the mayor. And I mean, as far as they're concerned, he can do no wrong. And when I when I use that, he's the Joe Biden of Seattle. Uh, it's funny the reactions that I get like, oh, yeah, that's a great, that's a perfect example. <laughs> like, Yeah, I don't really mean it probably the same way you think you mean it. Like, like I said, I don't think it's a bad thing, but I don't think it's a great thing. You know, you've been here a long time. Some of the reasons we're in the places we're in is because you've been here a long time and you got us here. Um, I don't necessarily think he's the savior that everybody's kind of hoping he's going to be. I hope he, I hope he has the ability. I mean, if he has, you know, me on city council, he has uh, Pete Hanning, he has Sarah Nelson, you know, now you have a third of the city council that are common sense people that want to work with him. 
Uh, you have Tanya Wu out of the second district, I think is a great uh, choice. Uh, Joy Hollingsworth seems like a, a really good but common sense person. Um, yeah, Phil Tavel. I mean, there's some some people that are running that, man, we could have a really great city council. We could We could see things really get better in months, not years, because there is that possibility. This idea that we just keep, oh, let's have another task force. Let's have another think tank. Let's have another sit around and talk about this for months and months and months. You know, let's hire outside people, a street czar who is a former pimp and give him $150,000 a year and let him get a staff of three. Uh, let's just do our job. Let's make sure that nine people in the city council have some common sense, can work together, have a good working relationship, because my understanding right now from city council is they don't talk with each other. Half of them don't even show up to city council. They're still calling in city council from their homes. You know, there's no like walking into somebody else's office like, hey, Sarah, I got this idea. Like, uh, mm-hmm. Tell me what you think about this. That does not exist in this current city council, that they are very much in their own camps and they do not talk to each other, work with each other very well, or even spend time in City Hall where they should be spending their time because my tax dollars and everybody else's tax dollars is paying them to be there a certain amount of time. That's what we should have in the future. Nine city council people. Listen, we're not going to get along on everything. Pete Hanning and I have been friends for 15, 20 years. And if we started talking about national politics or international politics, we would probably be pretty far off the center uh, as far as you know, our, our personal politics go. But when we start talking about the city and the things that we need, we all agree with the same things. You know, we want to try to get as many people off drugs as we possibly can. We want to have a path somewhere to land. Oh, what was one of your questions earlier? I apologize that I didn't get to that. Is, uh, yeah, some of the problems that we're having is, you know, you've only started some of the beginning issues of them. Like, okay, um, the health one with the fire department. When I went and interviewed with the firefighters union, I went in there, you know, thinking, okay, yeah, I know a lot about public safety, certainly more than anybody else is going to talk to you. And we had good, open, honest conversations. But one of the things I told them was, yeah, I would like to expand Health One. I think it's a fantastic program. I think you guys are doing great work. And they said, no, we, we don't want, that cannot get expanded. And we're like, really, why? And they're like, there's no place to go. There's no place for these folks to land. We can go out and do all the Health One stuff we have, but eventually, you know, we the idea is you take them somewhere, you, you go somewhere with them, you get them the help they need because we can't, we're just doing triage out on the street, whether it be, you know, medical or social or, you know, addiction or mental illness. But eventually there's no place to land any of these folks. There's no beds. There's no rehab facility we take them to. And and I totally agree. And I understood where they're coming from because we also have something for the police department. Only police officers are allowed to use the Involuntary Treatment Act. Yeah. And ITA is a powerful tool, something that we should be using more often, certainly for the most addicted, certainly for the most critically um, severe, mental, mentally ill people in the throes of, you know, those awful things that, not that the summertime is better than the wintertime, but, you know, in the wintertime, when you see somebody half naked out on the street on, you know, 3 Avenue at 3 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, they don't have any shoes on, and they're screaming at the top of their lungs, running in and out of traffic. You know, that's somebody that we take into protective custody. And that's one of the elements. It's either, you know, you're a danger to yourself, you're a danger to others, you're a danger to a large amount of property, or you're just gravely disabled. You know, that person who's just passed out and can't even get up, can't even walk, can't take care of themselves. Those are people that we take into protective custody. But he's right. There's no place to really land them because what happens for us is we call probably medic one first, if it's something that they medic one can take care of. But sometimes it's just one of those things where, man, they look fine. They, they just, you know, they just can't take care of them. So then we call AMR, which by the way, the city of course pays for, we as tax dollars, taxpayers pay for that transportation. So they show up, we do our very, very, very best to just talk them onto the gurney to get them in. But eventually they get strapped down because they are, you know, one of these four categories and, and AMR is not going to transport somebody that's just, you know, running around the back of their, their ambulance. So they usually get transported to Harborview Medical Center, sometimes some other hospitals, depending on the, um, the load of the different hospitals. But usually they just go in some hallway, yeah. you know, that it's not like they're getting like really amazing treatment. They certainly aren't getting triage like a gunshot wound or a, even a broken arm, you know, they just kind of get put in a hallway and eventually, eventually some social worker will come, uh, you know, a mental health professional of some variants will come talk to them. 
And if they've been there before and they've done that before and they've, you know, kind of coming out of that state of like, whether it be drugs or mental illness, they usually know the right things to say to the mental health professional to get them out of there. And so it's only the worst of the worst of the worst that get further treatment where they can actually be seen in front of a judge where they'll be taken into protective custody for like a 15-day hold. But it takes a lot. It really does. I mean, to the point where you're doing something really horrible to yourself or others before they'll, they'll keep you for those 15 days. Just because you're down there breaking glasses, you know, of, of businesses or throwing trash into the street or breaking cars, that usually doesn't keep you for very long. You know, you'll probably be out in three or four hours. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's some of the issues that we're dealing with is where, where do we branch out? And, and a lot of times we branch out into 16 different directions but none of them are really the same directions and none of them are usually effective for what, what we're dealing with. I wish it was easier to be able to show the public how the involves work. Uh, you know, in my other life, I get involved in some of those yeah. and they're handled really a lot more compassionately than I think people think when they hear the term involuntary. Oh commitment. yeah, it's for like sure. It's dragging and it's not the amount of effort that goes in you, out here. The county comes and does the assist. They're the ones who are going to sign the paperwork and yeah. ultimately be the one on paper on that. But there is so much effort yeah. to not make it what you think it is. Yeah, that old version of, um, you know, asylums and things of that, you know, that's before your and I's time. I mean, uh, you know, institutions like that just don't exist anymore. Um, and I'm certainly not an advocate for creating, you know, bringing that system back into effect. With that being said, you know, you have uh, places like Western that just don't have enough beds. I mean, there's just no space for these folks. There's no space in Harborview. And, I, and I'm listen, I'm, I'm not dogging on Harborview for putting them in a, in a hallway in the ER. They don't have any room for them. There's nowhere to put them. Um, they do have to keep a certain amount of beds and recesses open for real people that have like broken an arm, gotten stabbed, you know, or, in, you know, cardiac arrest. So, What's the solution? The solution is that we definitely need to expand a lot of these services. And you're right. Uh, we do our very, very, very best to not ever use force on these folks. Sometimes you don't have any choice. You know, if, if somebody strikes a police officer, eventually they're going to probably get put in handcuffs and they're probably going to go to jail, which also is not a great alternative. You know, the idea that we keep sending our mentally ill are most addicted to jail isn't a great place. The jailers don't want them, and I totally understand why. I don't feel comfortable taking them down there because I know they're not going to get any help in jail. If anything, they might actually, it might be worse for them in jail. But where's the alternative? You know, right. use a police officer. Tell, tell, me where I, tell me where I take them. I'll do it. You know, we had some areas for a while. You know, we had the Crisis Solutions Center. We had the mobile crisis team. We still have some versions of that, but... A lot of them work with like banking hours. They don't right. work at that three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday uh, to get them in there. Or they're overwhelmed as well that, you know, you'll call them and they're like, yeah, we're, we can get there in like three hours. I'm like, okay, I'm on third and pike with a half naked person. Uh, I don't think I can just hang out here for three hours, you know. And once again, there's nowhere to take them. We can't even take them back to the West Precinct or to some, you know, temporary facility. We, we can't take people and put those into holding cells in that condition. So... Yeah, there's a, there's a lot that the city council doesn't understand any of these things. You know, that's been the frustration is over four years I've been watching city council meetings when they talk about public safety and they talk about people who are in crisis. They don't know what they're talking about. They've never dealt with that. You know, maybe I've seen it a little bit. You know, there's a few of them that walk in downtown every now and then, but they're certainly not out at like 1030 at night walking through the Third Avenue in front of the Ross and seeing hundreds of people out there in that, that um, chronic state of high or trying to get high or trying to steal stuff to get high or now they're on meth in order to get, you know, steal something so then they can buy fentanyl so then they can get in that state again. Like city council isn't going to be down there. They don't understand those issues. And one of my um, competitors, Bob Kettle, who seems to be a very nice guy, you know, we've hung out um, through the campaign on a number of occasions. You know, he lives in upper Queen Anne in a really nice house. He's a retired Naval officer. And, um, you know, we have a lot in common just because we both served in the military and he's very active in his community. Certainly the upper Queen Anne community he's part, was part of the Queen Anne Community Council. Uh, he's been part of the West Precinct's um, community watch group uh, that's down there. 
he somehow thinks he kind of knows about law enforcement and thinks he knows about public safety. Um, he, he just doesn't. I mean, it, you just can't spend a few hours doing this. You, you kind of have to do more of the job. Now, I don't care if you're a police officer or a firefighter or an EMT or an emergency room nurse. Those people know about public safety. Those people know about these issues. Being retired, stay-at-home dad on top of Queen Anne, he knows about as much as whatever the news has told him or whatever, you know, the, the group that he's done. He said he did the Before the Badge, which is a program that we use for potential new officers so they can kind of see what policing is like. So he, he participated in that. I think that's like two hours. Uh, he's been on a ride along, which listen, I'll commend him because uh, I don't know if anybody on the city council has ever been on a ride along other than Sarah Nelson. I think she's been on a, a ride along or two. Um, I offered Andrew Lewis to go on a ride along when he first got uh, into office, not him directly offered his people for to tell him that I would take him on a ride along. I might not even be running for city council if he'd taken me up on that. You know, I might have been able to get him in the first, you know, right at the beginning and, and show him how the sausage is made. Who knows? But uh, it's always frustrated me that I don't see anybody on the city council ever like really engaging with uh, the police department or the fire department. I mean, go on a ride along on Medic One. That'll really open your eyes. As, and as you know, man, those people are dealing with some next level stuff too yeah. because these are 24 hour shifts, sometimes 48 hour shifts, depending if you're, you know, working overtime. And to be, I mean, some of our medic guys, they, they just don't even go to bed. That idea, that old school idea of like, you know, you're in your bed and the, the bells goes off and then I <laughs> make it chilly I, all yeah, the time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> then I, I go down the, the, uh, the pole and I put my bunker gear on, I get in and I go out to the call and then I come back and I've got three more hours to go to sleep. I'm not saying that there are not firefighters like that, but Seattle fire is not those and certainly not the medics. Those guys basically just stay awake for 24 hours because it's call after call after call after call. They're lucky if they get enough time to get back to their firehouse to, you know, eat a little something, use the restroom, clean ever off whatever thing they just dealt with on the last one, and then just go to the next call. So, yeah, city council should have somebody on city council that understands public safety a little bit better than just seeing it, what they, you know, see on TV or you know, what they might read about in the Seattle Times, which definitely is not a great paper for um, describing what public safety really is. I would like to see a city council that not only just has me on it, but has that really eclectic mix of different backgrounds, because I certainly know a lot about public safety, but I've had to learn a lot about the $7.4 billion budget that we have. I've had to learn a lot about design review, which I didn't realize was as controversial as it has been over the years. I know a lot more about it now than I did before, but I'll really be relying on other council members to help me on issues if I don't understand them or they're new to me. Um, Sarah Nelson, small business owner. I, you know, of course I'm going to ask her her opinions about small business. I ask my friends all the time. I have, uh, coming from the restaurant industry, most of my friends have n now are restaurant owners. You know, uh, Usually by the time you're in your 40s or 50s, you've kind of transitioned on over the the stupid thing of buying a restaurant or buying a bar and you own these things and listening to what they've had to go through to get their businesses open. I mean, it's just, it's soul crushing. <laughs> it's amazing. They went through the process of actually opening the business because Seattle just doesn't make it easy by any stretch. And so if I can provide a safe environment for them to open the business and then be receptive to the criticisms they have of the city and then try to work with them to try to streamline some things and I'm, I'm all for it. So I want to also get a chance today to talk about things outside of your core competency, sure. which is public safety, because yeah. I don't think you've gotten a chance really to, <laughs> to talk about that. But I did want to uh, at least have you speak to a couple large incidents that just happened because there are yeah. a lot of people's minds. So within roughly the last week, there was what was classified as a mass shooting up on Capitol Hill and that there were four people shot. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that it's clear how many shooters may have been involved. And sometimes the definition of mass shooting gets yeah. lost in that. Um, it came out of a take, what's called a takeover event. Mm -hmm. People who maybe aren't familiar with that. Um, basically people who were, you know, usually would go street racing, things like that, get to an area, close it off more or less and, yeah. and do what they want to do in an, in an area like Capitol Hill, you can do that more easily because people are used to going around. The well, and also like, you know, literally a few blocks away from where Chaz Chop was. Right. So that area is already tough for the Seattle Police Department and law enforcement in general. Absolutely. So that happens, and there are four four victims, one of which has passed away. A 20-year-old female. That's right. I'm not clear yet from what I've seen whether or not they were participating in the takeover or not, which really shouldn't matter. You shouldn't have to die over 
something like that, but it's not clear what their involvement even yeah. was. Well, and also the end of the Capitol Hill block party. Right, that's yeah. right. Um, and then the next weekend, down in the South End, down in Rainier Beach, yeah. there was just another shooting at a community event, of all things, um, Boys and Girls Club, I believe, were involved, an event that's meant to just bring community together, kind and, of an anti-violence sentiment. And anti-violence. Yes, and it sounds like possibly two may have been in a vehicle, came by and shot it up. Mm -hmm. Five victims, two of which are critical. It's not clear, again, were they the target, what their level of involvement was. They were in the crowd, basically. Yeah. And so those are two large events in a week. Uh, I saw Chief Diaz came out and spoke and had some words and talked about it being a gun, uh, guns on the street issue. Um, Mayor Bruce Harold also spoke at the second event. Um, a couple of things that also came in the backdrop of these two stories, specifically the first one. So in that takeover event, SPD was out. The takeover happened. There's a lot of video that came out. The crowd got pretty hostile. They wanted to come out and break it up. And in the past, usually police cars showing up, lights and sirens, everybody just left. Yeah. This is new. Now they're not. Not only are they not, they'll get hostile back. SPD took a stance of, hey, let's pull back. You, you're either going to have to massively escalate mm -hmm. or pull back. They chose to pull back. Yeah. And from the footage that I've seen, it, it made sense. It, it was either resource go up, or pull. Yeah. Then this last weekend, something I think got missed in a lot of the media's rundowns. So that night I was out covering news stories. I got a lot of footage mm -hmm. of, of that incident. Uh, sometime before they'd already gone to priority one calls, which for people who are not familiar, that means, you know, if you're getting, if someone's broken into your home, but they're not there anymore, you're probably not getting a response. So yeah, it could drop down to a priority two. That's right. So priority ones only. Um, they were already, I believe they were already doing cross precinct staffing. So they were thin. Mm -hmm. Still though, um, it was actually uh, a, a patrol officer who initiated the response saying, hey, I'm hearing shots. He, yeah. I believe he had said I, somewhere in the realm of 50. There were already resources heading. Then the 911 calls flood. They get there. Yeah, we call that on viewing. Right. Yeah. So what is your sense of what's going on? It is summertime. The, you know, we don't mm -hmm. usually see big crowds like that. And that is absolutely a, a, a joke. It's a seasonal business. Crime is a seasonal business. Yeah. People are outside. In the wintertime, people are more targeted with what they're doing. I think in the summertime, it is people just shooting all over the place, running, shooting, shooting at somebody else, and there's a lot more people outside. And they can be offended. Instead of going out with the plan to harm, mm -hmm. maybe something happened in the moment. But those are nine casualties yeah. in a week. What do you think is going on out there, and do you have any input on what you think would help this? Yeah, uh, a lot of input. I should uh, premise it for the listener that um, – Starting July 1st, I took an unpaid leave of absence from the Seattle Police Department just to run for city council full time. When we got slated to go to the, when my team, which already has a very high operational tempo, got slated to go to the Community Violence Task Force, they warned us, hold on, it's going to get even faster and a higher tempo. So I did that for June. It was really difficult because I'm trying to run for city council on my days off, which were only at that time, like Sunday, Monday, which is hard to run for city council two days a week, especially one of them being Sunday and do this task force in which, you know, I've had to have to have my head straight. I got to make sure that my concentration is 100% in the game that I can't be thinking about, you know, campaigning and stuff like that for my safety, my teammate safety, the general public safety. And I'm good at that. I'm, really good at, you know, compartmentalizing things. But it became clear about July 1st, right before July 1st, probably the week before. And listen, I, I got to give it up to the, the chain of command to allow me to do this in such a short uh, time frame because we had 4th of July coming up, which for us is called a red dotted date. That means you cannot take that day off. Just, you know, I don't want a vacation on the 4th of July. Yeah, you and everybody else. No, you can't. Th those are called red dots. So you, you have to have something pretty major going on in your life in order to have that day off. Then we had the Major League All-Star game right after that, which obviously very resource heavy. And I don't know if people realize how much of downtown Seattle was taken over by MLB, including the University of Village as well. I mean, MLB wasn't just the stadium. It was all over Seattle. Um, then we had Taylor Swift concert. I mean, there was there was a lot of heavy lifts that the Seattle Police Department was um, required to participate in and assist. And so... Me, I have incredible FOMO. I, I this overwhelming urge that something is going to happen when I'm not there, and it's you know I feel like 
I could have been there to, you know, be the, be part of the solution. So I have a very hard time taking time off work, especially when there's like stuff going on. I almost want to take my entire team and vacation together just so they don't get to do anything fun while I'm, while I'm gone or something major while I'm gone. So I've been on an unpaid leave of absence, which sucks. I mean, nobody doesn't like getting a paycheck. I mean, I'm single, so <laughs> I am the sole provider of, of my household. Um, so with that being said, I don't know the absolute details of everything, nor can I really speak of them because I am a current Seattle police officer. And I did tell the chain of command when I was going to run for city council that I would leave things like tactics and current cases off the table. I wouldn't talk about them, but I can talk about in generalities because I have been a citizen of Seattle for 20 plus years. I have lived in downtown well over 10, 15 years now. Um, and I've been through this rodeo before, as, as we were talking about. It, the summer is just one of those things that just, it's seasonal and it, it just, it seems to explode every summer that I've been a police officer. So, um, first things first, the Cal Anderson and the street racers. Street racers have been an issue with the city of Seattle for quite a long time. I don't know if the city of Seattle, King County Sheriff's Department, and maybe even the Washington State Patrol, though they seem to be more effective at it than we are, knows how to deal with street racing yet. When you have people come from outside of the city, so the, we have made street race, racer arrests. They usually don't happen right then and there. What you don't understand is usually later we'll have the ability to possibly contact somebody and arrest somebody. But my experience is that 99% of these folks do not live in the city of Seattle. They take advantage of the fact that right now Seattle is so short of officers that they can get, they can get away with that lawlessness. Um, before, earlier this year, I mean, there's obviously that very famous video of right in front of the Space Needle, you know, mm-hmm. that's what, that fifth and, um, fifth and broad, you know, them doing donuts and then they end up tagging like three people, like they <laughs> whip a car into like three people. And, you know, that was what, two years ago? And back then, our, our, our tactic or our, our response, I can't talk about tactics, but our, our response was, you know, kind of surround these folks. And you're right, you know, the lights and sirens usually would get them to move on or they, they freak out like, oh, my, it's the cops, run. Yeah. <laughs> so they take off. That was half the fun when I was a kid. Of course. Yeah, listen, man, I, I, I remember camping in the woods out in like Snoqualmie and hearing like a siren go off. You're like, oh, my God, it's yeah. cops, run. You know, like. <laughs> Dumb stuff like that uh, when you're a teenager. This wasn't, I guess, kind of an effective tactic for a while because it, it seemed to have worked, you know, once the police would show up, you know, party's over, let's go. That's not the same way anymore. They they realize that there's just not much um, law enforcement's willing to do. It's not that we can't do something. It's just that I think that right now the political will is not there to do much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, taking your, your license plates off your car so it's hard to identify who you are is illegal. Um, we have ordinances in the city about filming people, you know, um, that anti-surveillance ordinance is difficult. You know, it, it, it poses some legal questions about what we're doing. And, and I'm all for the cameras that they're talking about putting in. I think that's, that's better than nothing, yeah. but I wonder how effective they're going to be because quite frankly, if you don't have a license plate to go off of, and if you got tinted out windows, it's pretty hard to like, where does that ticket go to? Or, you know, you can certainly address it to certain vehicles and, you know, you could build a portfolio of, of cars that you keep seeing over and over and over. There's ways to work with it. But I'm wondering if at some point the city council or somebody in somebody body is going to sue the city of Seattle over that surveillance ordinance because cameras have been very controversial in the city of Seattle now. I don't want us to be a surveillance state by any stretch. Right. You know, I, I'm not looking for London to have CTV everywhere in the city. I, you know, I don't need somebody following me when I'm going down to get a bite to eat or, you know, pick my nose in public or something right. like that. You know, I think that's really intrusive. But we certainly can use some common sense and have some effective tools. Um, right now, if somebody goes missing, we don't have the ability to put a drone up in the air. Hmm. A drone would be a fantastic, especially in a wooded area, Discovery Park. You know, a kid goes missing in Discovery Park. How easy would it be to put a drone up in the air 
that has flare on it, the forward looking infrared and be able to see a warm body in the woods at night. And yeah. you know, that would be an effective tool that we could use surveillance for, but we can't do that. Now other cities can, I mean, we went over to Redmond almost in the exact same scenario as we were over there doing something else, a, a different mission, but I think they end up having a lost child in uh, Marymore park. They threw their drone up, found the kid in probably five minutes. We do it out here. I'm the drone up for this yeah, area. And we do it for fire. We do it for recovery, all of it. It's so simple. Yeah. It is such a simple thing. Like, how, could, how do we not agree on that? Seattle Police Department at one point sent a bunch of Seattle police officers to become drone operators. They had to be certified by the FAA. And so I think the city of Seattle paid a fair amount of money. I want to say it was like $20,000 oh, each yeah. for them to go to these schools where they became certified to fly drones and they had the FAA certification and the city nixed it. In fact, I think that might have even been how the surveillance ordinance started mm -hmm. was they heard that the Seattle Police Department was going to be having these drones with cameras on them and they probably went through their minor minority report video <laughs> collection in their head and said, no, nah, no, nah, we're not doing yeah. that. Um, so there are effective tools that we could be using for surveillance. And certainly some of that we could use for street racing. You know, um, it is a lot easier to arrest somebody or to, um, identify somebody if you have the ability to follow them and not necessarily in a police car, the city needs to come up with what they want to do because we certainly have the ability to go in there with, more, I don't want to say force, but with more authority mm -hmm. than we did, you know, certainly, and I don't want a Monday morning quarterback, any of the people that were there, officers, supervisors, commanders, chiefs, um, it was certainly expressed to my folks and the people that were, that I know that were there, that they made the right decision by pulling back, that we just didn't have the resources effective to go in and, you know, start getting potentially in use of force encounters with different people. Right. But it, it becomes like that, um, that old Mardi Gras thing that happened in Seattle back in the what, late 90s, early 2000s, where you had such a large group in the command staff and the, the political will of that time was to not go in and take care of that. And some kid ended up dying. You know, he had to mm -hmm. beat over the head with a skateboard and ended up dying. And then, of course, everybody was like, well, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you go in there? Well... The flip side of that is if you, you don't assume necessarily people are going to die in a crowd that's largely nonviolent. I mean, obviously, this group on Broadway was a little different. They were showing signs of pretty heavy aggression towards the, the police yeah. department. But, man, it's 50-50, you know, what do you do? 20-20 hindsight, I should say, mm -hmm. is, okay, you go in there with a little more of a heavy hand. You start maybe using some um, chemical deterrence. Mm -hmm. Well, the city doesn't seem to like that very much right, right. now, and that's very controversial. So uh, everybody's up in arms. Oh, my gosh, they're on Broadway again, and they're releasing OC gas on, on people. They're, they're using their chemical agents to, to break up crowds. That used to be an old tactic for sure back in the late 90s, early 2000s, by, by all means. I don't know what the tactic is, and, and that's coming from um, a citizen who watches this really closely. I, I know that they're definitely discussing it. I know that they are definitely trying to figure out what that, that looks like going forward. But I think that's up to the city uh, citizens of Seattle as well to have input on this. You know, here are your options. Here are the tools we have. Here is what we're proposing as an option. Which do you want to see go forward? And that's where, you know, city council and the mayor's office needs to step up and say, like, this is what I'd like to see. This is what I wouldn't like to see. Police department can be flexible. They can do a lot of different things, and we have shown that. And um, the officers that I work with and the people that I see every single day have that flexibility, but um, they need they need that direction from the highest echelons of, of government to deal with this. Um, moving forward to the um, other events, um, well, let's talk about the Safeway or the Rainier Beach. Uh, it's summertime. I've been... I've spent a lot of time down in that the Rainier Valley during the summertime, and the fact that there was a police officer or police officers near there during that doesn't surprise me even a little bit. I've spent a lot of time in that Safeway parking lot near that liquor store, and um, it's absolutely tragic that during an event like that that somebody would have the audacity to drive in there and, and just openly start shooting at people. shows a lot about where we are and shows a lot about how little people care about life and the dangers that they're putting other people in, in. I have never seen more instances of everybody seeming to have a gun than I have in the last three or four years. I mean, 
it wasn't like it was uncommon before. It wasn't like I'd arrest somebody be like, oh my God, a gun? No way. Um, but now it just seems like everybody does. Every, every felony arrest we make now, it seems like it's not just a gun, it's multiple guns, or it's a gun with an extended magazine. Um, there's video of me, which once again, we set out a press release and it wasn't to really brag. It wasn't really to, well, I guess it was a little bit to raise some awareness or some kind of media attention, but there's video of me in late June, uh, and my team chasing down a known felon that we knew was a drug dealer that had a warrant for his arrest that every time we've ever arrested him, he's had a gun on him. And so when we went to contact him for his warrant, he ran, we got into a foot pursuit. Uh, we were able to catch him within about a block and, uh, his gun had ended up falling down his pants into the inner thigh of his leg, uh, uh, Glock. Mm -hmm. And so there's video of me with my body worn. It's like cutting his pants up and taking this loaded, you know, chambered gun out of his, the crotch area of his, of his pants. And, um, you know, stolen firearm, felon with a gun. And here's a guy who's running for city council on a pro public safety platform who is physically getting guns off the street and yet the news just didn't seem to care. It was, it was put on Cairo. I mean, that's, that's where I got the video was Cairo put it out. And, you know, we contacted Cairo's like, you know, that's actually one of the city people that's running for city council <laughs> in that video. Nothing. They just didn't seem to care. Like I said, I, it's not that was new or anything like that. And I'm not bragging about me. I'd rather just brag about my team, my team or the, the, the folks that are doing that. In fact, my partners, uh, somebody initially said, man, you run pretty fast for an old guy. I was like, that first opening scene, that wasn't me. That was my partner. He's <laughs> younger and way faster than me. Uh, I was there quickly, but <laughs> yeah, we leave some of the younger guys for or, and gals for that matter that uh, have better knees than my 49-year-old body has. So it's just unfortunate and tragic that this keeps happening over and over and over. And um, like I said, at the highest elements of city government, we just don't do more. And part of that, like I said, is, is hiring more police officers, having more effective patrol. When we did have more officers, it was not uncommon for us to get a request to watch where we could go down like, hey, the Boys and Girls Club is having an event. It's mm -hmm. going to be at the, you know, I think that's about the 9600 block of, of Rainier Avenue South. It'll be near the Safeway. We'd love it if you came down and just kind of hang out in the area and maybe interact with the crowd because there was a time where community policing in my mind and, and how I started was we go mix in with the crowd a little bit. You know, we don't have to hang out the entire time. You know, not everybody wants cops hanging out at their party or their get together. But I think most people like to know that there's somewhere around, yeah. you know, if they're, if they're doing an event, that's not, you know, obviously street racers don't want cops hanging out at their event, but uh, you know, a community organizing, of course they do. You know, they're having a picnic in the park. Mm -hmm. They're having a farmer's market. They're having like what is what would be considered a soft target. Of course you want some police officers to hang around. You know, it, it deters violence. You know, if somebody comes into the parking lot and they see a marked patrol car sitting there right next to the event, they're hopefully going to think twice unless they're completely, you know, lost their mind or they, they have some kind of like need to do a suicide by cop. But we're not at that place anymore. We sure. just don't have enough officers to do all of these events and do a request to, to watch and do that proactive community policing. Um, and so you get these events that are absolutely tragic. And if I was Bruce Harrell, if I was the mayor, I would probably be blaming the city council for the things that they've done over the last two years. You got us to this place. You got us to only 800 officers. And by 800 officers, that's not 800 patrol officers. Those are not people answering 911 calls. It's, it's a dual slap in the face for the citizens of Seattle is that you have fewer patrol officers who can actually go out and answer 911 calls, but you have fewer follow-up officers. So that case of rape, burglary, fraud, identity theft, you know, that eventually gets pushed up to a detective. And if there's fewer detectives and some of those units don't even exist anymore, like, yeah. you know, um, auto thefts and things like that, 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 traffic collision investigation is down to like bare bones. I mean, every, every follow-up unit is down to bare bones. Mm -hmm. So they're only taking the highest priority cases. So your lower level case of like, you know, somebody stole my credit card and uh, racked up, you know, $5,000 worth of stuff. And I have video of them doing it. I've got a great video of them, you know, 
they they use my name and opened another bank account and it, it's going to take a while to have somebody look into that because it's just it's pretty low on the totem pole as far as crime goes and as far as follow-up units go and i have enough friends in the city that call me all the time like hey man can you help me out with this i'm like tell me what's going on tell me the case number i can't necessarily look it up but i can i can give you some sound advice and maybe if i know the the detective or the follow-up maybe i'll try to ask but when it's something that's i i just know is not on the the radar you know I'll, i'll just tell them how it is i'm like listen man your car getting broken into last week in your garage and your laptop getting stolen out of it when you've got video of just some looks like a male figure yeah. in all black with his face covered and gloves on and you know there's no physical evidence left behind you just have this really grainy video that your apartment gave you i don't know what to tell you man i mean yeah. look on offer up if you see something on offer up call us again about your laptop but I just don't know what a detective can do at this point or that they have the bandwidth to go down there and, and deal with that. You can certainly send the video in. I mean, we have we have good means of taking evidence in, but I just it just goes down to the lack of lack of bodies. For sure. So obviously your core competency is public service and specifically public safety. Yeah. And so a lot of the questions I have seen people ask are always about public safety in the city and, and we're all thinking about it, we're all seeing it. I get it. Yeah. But city council members do more than that. Mm-hmm. What else? Is, what else do you care about? What else are you passionate about? Um, Steve, I'm glad you asked that because uh, you're right. Uh, <coughs> I have a very dear friend who, near the beginning of this, said, "Man, you need to stop talking so much about being a cop. Like, there's a lot of people out there that don't like cops, and you might not get elected because you're a cop." And I was like, "Well, I totally get what you're saying, but right now, public safety is the biggest thing." And I'm listening to a city council that has no idea what they're talking about, you know. So I do need to address that first and foremost. But his point was well taken in that most of our conversations when we're out to dinner or hanging out aren't really about public safety. You know, we sometimes talk about crime and things that I've done. But a lot of it is about what Seattle was what Seattle is right now and and what Seattle should look like in the future. And it's tough to see where Seattle is right now. I think we can all agree, by and large, that it's not a great place. Is it as bad as it was? Eh, Maybe not. Is it getting better? Yeah, for sure. I I do see some um, positive things happening. But we do have an opportunity I think Andrew Lewis in this current city council has gutted Seattle so badly as far as small businesses, medium-sized businesses. You know, Nike's left us. Columbia Sportswear has left us. Most of the downtown core is empty as far as small business spaces, boarded up. You know, even Upper Queen Anne. um, There's this little shot that I love called the Queen Anne Dispatch, and it's um, oddly enough like cards and women's clothes, but I always go there for gifts. So my mom, my sister, anybody who's significant in my life usually gets a gift from Queen and Dispatch because not only do they have cool stuff, but they have cards right there and they gift wrap for you. Plug for Queen and Dispatch. But their front windows on their doors have been boarded up with black plywood for probably a year, year and a half now because they just keep getting broken into time after time after time again. So... What I want to see going forward is I want to see us decide what we want to see in downtown specifically and and Seattle as a whole. Like, what does our community look like? My vision is that I would prefer it to be small and medium-sized businesses. Now, some of those small and medium-sized businesses might grow to rather large businesses. Nordstrom's started off as just a little shoe shine stand. That's why they still do shoe shines and Nordstrom's is because that's their roots is they were a little shoe shine shop that happened to then start making shoes and fixing shoes, and they've grown to this, the Nordstrom's. Um, Same with UPS. UPS was just a very tiny little um, messenger service here in Seattle that grew into what we now know as as UPS, and and countless stories like that. There's, um, man, there's a great thing, documentary on Como, that talks about the history of business in Seattle and Man, you forget how many places have started here and become the world. I mean, obviously, Boeing is the, I mean, that's the easy one. Every Microsoft, of course, things like that. But, man, there's little tiny ones that you kind of forget, like, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a Seattle thing. I, yeah. I totally forgot that. So 
what I'd like to see is small and medium sized businesses starting to flourish in downtown. Obviously, they have to have a safe environment to open. But we also need to look about the livability of Seattle. So while I've been a cop for 10 years, I was actually a bartender longer than I've been a cop. And like I was saying earlier, I, I don't believe we can go backwards. I don't want to go backwards. You know, the idea of saying, like, man, that 2015, that was a great year in Seattle. I had so much fun that year. That's great. That was 2015. We're going to 2024. What is our, What do we look like in the future? And some of the things that I see going into the future is that we need to maybe get off of some of the stereotypical things that Seattle has done. You know, uh, somebody comes from out of town. What do they think about Seattle? Well, it's coffee. You know, certainly you get a cup of coffee almost anywhere. And for a while, it looked like there was a Starbucks on every corner of the city of Seattle. Um, salmon. You know, that's a, oh, you guys have that cedar plank salmon up there that I love so much. Like, yeah, okay, I get it. You guys all wear flannel and you listen to grunge music. Yeah, that was a thing for a while. And unfortunately, yeah, I think it's coming back. You know, actually, not unfortunate. I'm, I was just listening to Pearl Jam the other day. I still still love that band. Um, but what does the new Seattle look like? And I think the new Seattle going forward looks way more eclectic and way more open than the old Seattle did. Um, I do like the blue collar roots that we had. And I wish we had a little bit more of that. I wish we had some more industry. I wish we had some more... Um, love for our maritime industry and we uh, brought them into the fold and into the mix so they're just not kind of on the outlying areas of the city but I will say that when I walk around downtown and certainly South Lake Union there's some food trucks that are wildly popular that you know there's two block long lines getting waiting to go to a food truck and I'm like what is this well they're usually from areas where those Amazon employees are from. They're so unique to them that, listen, I haven't had this dish since I moved to Seattle. And this is the only, this is the only thing that sells this thing that I just love, that my mother made me, that I grew up having. I would love to see what we could do to like make those more brick and mortars. Because one of the problems I see right now is that these tech workers don't seem to be going out at night. You know, they seem to be very, I don't want to say they're introverted because I talk to a lot of them. I live in a building that has a lot of tech workers in it, and they're very friendly. I mean, they're, you know, I see them in the gym. Uh, we certainly talk in the elevator. We talk in the lobby. Um, but what is it that they're not going out at night and pursuing? Now, is it a safety thing? Yeah, I think that's certainly part of it, is if you're not from this city and you don't feel safe going out in the city after dark, you're, you're not going to go out. I don't care what kind of cool restaurant, art, music you have. But... I do want to tap into the idea that we have folks from all over the world here. We are probably one of the most international cities, and we've been that way for a long time. I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but I think it's even more so now than it ever has been before. And what is it that would appeal to them to go out and make Seattle livable again? What is it that, because when you have really nice crowds of people going out and enjoying themselves, when you have that sidewalk cafe when you have that really good music venue, it attracts more people to it. I just had a uh, friend, I'm old enough now, that my friend's daughter turned 21. <laughs> Scared the hell out of me, but yeah. And he's also a police officer. And I was like, well, you're going to bring him to the city, right? Because he lives in the city. He's one of the unicorns like me. He lives in downtown. He's like, oh, hell no. I'm like, really? You know she's, I don't think I'm giving too much away. She goes to school in New Orleans, you know, so she, it's not like she <laughs> doesn't know what we're way around. It's like, no, I just, I don't want to deal with Seattle, man. It's just, there's too much. It's like, we're going over to Bellevue. I was like, really? It's like, I'm not a big fan of Bellevue. So we went over there and, you know, of course I'm, you know, be a good wingman to my, my buddy and, and a bunch of her girlfriends are out with her and we're not being chaperones, but we're making sure that they are having a good time without getting too much into trouble. And I got to tell you, Bellevue did a great job. You know, it was fun. There was great places to go to. We had a great meal. Um, you know, at some point about midnight, I, of course, was like, all right, my, my old body is going back to, <laughs> to Seattle. <laughs> but they stayed there and they had hotel rooms at the W. And so he said they had a great time. They stayed out until two in the morning. Clubs were awesome. Uh, everybody was really friendly. You know, there's plenty of parking. And I think that about Seattle, like, God, you know, where could I have taken them? It, had he wanted to do something, where could I have taken them? Yeah. Now, I don't want to just make Seattle, like, a fun place for 21-year-olds. And it's, certainly there's clubs to go to. There's bars to go to. 
But what is it that we, we appeal to the most amount of people? Like, how do we make it that it's easy to get here? It's safe once you get here. Whether you drive or whether you want to take public transit, take an Uber, you know, what is it that we can do to appeal to people to bring them back into Seattle? Because like when you and I were kids, when we were younger, Seattle was a fun place to go. You know, that was the place you went and saw the cool bands that you went to that cool restaurant. Even before I was 21, like uh, Beth's Cafe was open 24 hours. <laughs> and, you know, you could you could watch this line cook in there and make a 24 egg omelet while he's smoking a cigarette with one hand that had uh, it was a it was a prosthetic hand. He had like the double hook <laughs> yep. and he'd have cigarettes and he'd be smoking with his prosthetic hand cooking your 24 egg <laughs> omelet. Man, when I was in high school, I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Um I don't know if he's available anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's even still yeah. alive. He was living a hard yeah, life. Yeah, he was living a hard life. I think he was like 30 and it looked like he was 90 back then. But, um, but what is it that draws people into downtown of all age groups? My parents, a, a perfect example. I, they moved out of the city. They moved out of Kirkland. They moved over to eastern Washington. Some of it was economics. I mean, they got a smoking deal for their house in Kirkland. And they do love the lifestyle of eastern Washington. Um, dad's a big skier, so, you know close to the mountains was good for him. Mm-hmm. But I would love them to come into downtown Seattle and go to Benaroya Hall. You know, my mom absolutely loves the Seattle Symphony. She loves the arts. She loves plays. She loves musicals. My dad is really into the art world. You know, he was a painter, a photographer. Um, as, you know, a side life outside of being an engineer, he would love to go. He used to go on the art walks all the time. You know, that was a big part of his life. He worked in downtown Seattle his entire life after he got out of the Air Force. Worked for Seattle City Light, actually. And he would go on art walks. He would actually drag us down there as kids. And, you know, when you're a teenager, you're not really into the art walks as much as maybe as you are as an adult. But I would love for them to be able to come into the city again and do those kind of things. You know, they're in their 70s now. I wouldn't want them to do this in this environment, you know. They both have their wits about them. They're both in good shape. But I just wouldn't feel comfortable with them walking around the city right now. But... That's the kind of people that I want to attract to come back to the city, uh, maybe even to live in the city. Uh, they've talked about that in the future of, all right, you know, we live in the country where there's a lot of snow right now. Eventually, we're going to get too old to be dealing with shoveling snow and, and things like that. So we do want to come back to a, a more of a city center where we have more health care options and we have more options that short little walks where we can go do fun stuff. I don't know if Seattle's that way anymore. I mean, I'd like to get it back there. It would be fantastic and healthy for our economy and for our community to have people of every socioeconomic background here. You know, I want more waiters, bartenders, cops, firefighters, nurses, teachers to be able to afford to live in downtown. Um, you know, I, I pay a lot for my rent. Uh, I'll be honest, it's $3,000 a month, but still I'm getting a good deal. Like relative to what other people are paying, that's still a pretty good deal. And it's just because I've been there so long and I have a private owner who has, you know, graciously said, listen, you're, you're making my mortgage payment for me. I appreciate you. You know, you take good care of the place. I'll just keep it as it is. We'll just kind of have this agreement that moving forward, and I won't ever raise the rent if you're okay with this amount. So I have been okay with that amount, but I know some friends that are paying for yeah. almost $5,000, especially if you have kids or you need more than like, you know, I have a one bedroom with a tiny little den. If you needed like a two bedroom, yeah, you're looking at 4,000, 4,500 plus, if you want to live in downtown, that is. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, those are the things I'd like to see. I'd like to see the city be way more livable, um, have a nightlife more than just people going out nine to five. I'd like to get people involved in the community way more. I said at one of our meetings, we were talking about business. And the question was about Amazon. You know, how do you feel about the head tax and and things of that nature? And and a lot of these... Uh, Q and A's, you know, I'm only allowed two minute answers. So sometimes it's just important for me to get to the point. Unlike this, where I can <laughs> talk about things a little bit more is I said, no on the head tax. That's uh, a stupid move. I don't know why you would do that. It doesn't seem fair. I don't think it's constitutional. And I think you're just hurting yourself by doing that, hurting the city by doing that. But I do want to see more groups of people involved in the city. Now, Amazon is the 900 pound gorilla in the room. I mean, it is basically all of Sa- South Lake Union now is, is Amazon country yeah. or something that supports Amazon. And yeah, I mean, sometimes it's a little rough, like the traffic now between like three and f- seven o'clock in South Lake Union is unbearable. You know, I, I don't have to drive that many places because I walk to work. I have two bicycles, so I bike a lot of different places. 
but man, every now and then you got some place to go, you got somewhere to be, and it is it is unbearable trying to get out or get back into the city because everything is so clogged. Now, I, I want to get into transportation next, but Amazon is the 900-pound gorilla that I think we need to come to terms with. They do provide us a lot of benefits. They do provide really great jobs for people in Seattle. It does attract a lot of people to Seattle, and I think overall they have been a positive for Seattle. I can certainly be critical of what they've done to the housing market. I can be critical of maybe some of the sweetheart deals they've gotten, but I do think they're an important part of our economy now. I mean, our economy is largely driven by downtown Seattle. That is the engine. With that being said, the small businesses and some, to a certain extent, the medium-sized businesses, that's our community. You know, that's the, the barber shop that, you know, the barber who always, you know, cuts my beard just the perfect way. Uh, that's the bartender you go see that knows the cocktail that I absolutely love having when I go in there and is ready for me and knows my name when I walk in there. Um, that grocery store that I go into where I, I, you know, I love going in there and bumping into people that I know and, and knowing people that work there. Those little small businesses, I mean, Olga's place, the Proshki Proshi, that's like a, that's a Seattle institution now. You know, these are places where you can go in and you know the owner. These are, these are what build community. This is what community looks like in my mind. And I want District 7 specifically to have that feel and, and not just, you know, I think Queen Anne has that feel to, for the most part, certainly upper Queen Anne, you know, it's stripped from, uh, Mag- what is it? Uh, McGraw all the way down to, um, uh, Garfield mm. is like just a really cool area to walk. It's like a really cool track to walk. Great coffee shops, great little boutiques, great little restaurants. Um, you know, your, my dry cleaner is still up there. I still drive all the way to the top of Queen Anne to go to the dry cleaner uh, just cause I like her, you know, mm-hmm. she's been my dry cleaner forever. My tailor's up there. I love, I love this guy. You know, I've been going to him since I was probably in my late twenties. So that's the kind of community that I want to build throughout the city. And I think downtown certainly lacks that. It's more difficult downtown because obviously we have a lot more people going through downtown, but I think we could build that back in downtown. Um, I want people to cross pollinate these areas as well. It'd be really cool to have, you know, I think people on top of Queen Anne are a little reluctant to come into downtown, certainly at night. I think downtown is reluctant to climb up that giant hill to get to the top of Queen Anne sometimes, certainly at night, uh, to go deal with those folks. Um, I want them to be, D7 to be a lot more um, interchangeable and have a better community, a sense of, you know, I know people in South Lake Union. I know people that work at the waterfront. I know people that work in Pike Place Market. I love going down to, uh, you know, El Gaucho at night or going to Il Bistro for a late night Italian. These are things that I think we need more in downtown Seattle um, as far as the livability. Those are the things that, man, I'm really passionate about. And the things that I talk about the most, like right now, I feel like we live on a cruise ship a little bit. Because if you haven't had dinner by 8 o'clock at night, you're probably not getting dinner in downtown. There's just not that many places that do late night dining anymore, you know. Uh, Once again, like I said, we can't go backwards, but 10 years ago, man, I didn't get in the shower until 9 o'clock at night because there was 20 or 30 places that served dinner until midnight or 1 in the morning. And now, man, you're hard-pressed to find one or two, and it's usually just Fridays or Saturdays that they do that. But the only place I can go is third. I always have equipment in my car. And sure. I the night. So yeah, I you're going to leave that too. coins because yeah. I get the, the parking garage, and yep. that's it. Exactly. Right. And even 13 coins isn't 24 hours anymore. That's right. They uh-uh. are, yeah, that's right. Not only are they not 24 hours anymore, this is my cop side of me because I work nights and I – I'm often looking for places to eat late at night. Uh, they're only open until 2 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays. I think they close at midnight every other day of the week. So, yeah, it's um, those are some of the things that I'd like to move forward on as far as the livability, a little more of the nightlife, and really investing in small businesses. Um, I spoke really briefly on transportation. Yeah, I'd love to go back to that, that really quickly. I don't know how you get around this city if you have to drive, yeah. you know, as a job. And I understand that there's the war on vehicles, and I understand the environmental aspects of it, but there are certain things that we still need delivered. You know, you still have to have a delivery truck take your kegs of beer, your pallets of food, your whatever, and it is so difficult to get around this city. It, it's it got to drive people absolutely insane. Now, I'm a police officer, so I definitely drive around the city, and I know kind of the, the best ways to get through there, but it's like people at SDOT never even talked to law enforcement or any kind of public safety when they came up with these designs. Bell, Bell Street is a perfect example. 
Bell Street used to be a good way for us to launch and go from east to west, west to east, not on Bell Street necessarily. Bell Street obviously goes westbound, but that area. And then you knock it down to two lanes of bike lanes, and I'm a biker, and I, I love having bike lanes, but not every street in the entire city of Seattle <laughs> needs a bike lane on it. And then a parking lane, and then one lane of travel where inevitably some Uber driver who is desperate to make the delivery stops, throws their flashes on, runs inside, and now all of a sudden you have an emergency vehicle that, has, that can't get around, not to mention traffic is backing up three blocks regardless. And I'm in a rather small car. I'm in a patrol car. Imagine trying to get a ladder truck through there. Right. You know, insignia catches on fire and you can't get the ladder truck anywhere near there. That's a problem. And it's like, man, did nobody ask in SDOT? Like, hey, maybe we should talk to some other people. Because one of the first things I'd love to do is have a, a meeting with SDOT. Now, I understand that uh, when Bruce Harrell got into office, one of the first things he did was let go of the head of SDOT. Now, I don't know what the reason was behind that specifically. But, man, if it was something about the design of the city, <laughs> I am all for that because there are so many times where I'm sure you and anybody else who's had to drive in the city are cussing the lights out. None of them are synced up. We don't have any of those pressure pads that make, make them sync up. They're even so unsynced that nothing makes sense where you drive and it doesn't sync up. You walk and you still have to stop at every single block for them. You bike and they're not synced up. Like, okay, what is this designed for? Is it just random? You know, is it just picking a second <laughs> and flipping the lights? If you're on Mercer and trying to make a left, uh, whether it be onto Fairview, Westlake, or Ninth, that light only gives you like three seconds. You know, you got cars backed up all the way to I-5, but you have three seconds to make a left turn. And it's like, who came up with this? Do we not have cameras up? I mean, once again, we go back to the surveillance. Do we not have cameras that like look at this stuff? Right. If you're disabled in this city, I don't understand how you get around the sidewalks. You know, if you're in a wheelchair or a walker, the sidewalks are so uneven. They're so just absolutely put together. I think what happens is construction, you know, a new building gets built. The sidewalks get absolutely trashed by the construction company who built the building, and yet somehow they're not obligated to fix any of the sidewalks. Um, these kind of things absolutely drive me insane about downtown. And some of Queen Anne, I mean, I've obviously put my my miles in walking around Queen Anne door knocking and doorbelling and, uh, you know, making myself known up there. But I always kind of shake my head like, man, how does an old person get around? Like as if you had a cane or you were, you know, not really that nimble on your feet. Like I've already tripped dozens of times, you know, off of uneven sidewalks, the streets, you know, in all honesty, I have a big truck. I like to ski. I like to camp. Um, my truck is over 20 years old. I've had it forever. I've never had a car payment in my entire life. And uh, driving my truck around downtown Seattle, it feels like my fillings are getting rattled out of my teeth. It's like the most uneven roads. I used to say, like, man, it feels like we're in third world Mexico or something like yeah. that. Man, I was down in Cabo. They have the nicest, smoothest yes. highways I've ever seen in my entire life. I was like, man, I could, I could have coffee t filled to the very brim right now, and I wouldn't even be able to feel that these roads are so nice. So that old, uh, that old joke doesn't play very well anymore because these streets are way worse than that. And I've had friends come from other areas like, what is up with your streets? Why does everything seem like it's was under construction or they started like a road program, but then just left. Yeah. And so I mentioned my daughter's got cerebral palsy, so yeah. she can walk. Yeah. But when we go downtown or anywhere out there, I'm right there with her. Cause I'm always where she's going to trip on yep. something. And it's in, in an area that seems so sensitive to so many things. Yeah. That's pretty basic. A hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and it even gets back to the, the, the t once again, kind of back to the camping and the tent thing is like, you know, that was one of the problems in this new court case that has just come out about obstruction. What is obstruction? Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll tell you what obstruction is. When somebody in a wheelchair or a walker or an older person can't get by, they can't go from point A to point B because there's a giant tent in the way. Let's call that obstruction. Is that fair enough? Um, uh, it's just really frustrating that 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 came out. And I and listen, real change has been no friend to me. They they've kind of blasted me just because I'm a cop without ever asking me any questions whatsoever. And I but I still buy real change. Um, Walter's a guy who's up on top of Queen Anne, who's out in front of the Starbucks where I've been meeting a lot of my friends to go out and do some uh, campaign work. He's out there. He sells real change. You know, of course I buy it just to to you know promote what he's doing. Mm -hmm. But I'm also always curious. You know, I've been buying 
real change for a long time. I used to read The Stranger all the time back when it was kind of a fun paper to read. Yeah. Now it's just, it's unfortunately a rag that I, I don't care for anymore. <laughs> but uh, even the the stra- or the real time was talking about this court case. And, you know, they were talking about it obviously in a positive way because for whatever reason, they still want a lot of encampments to be uh, legalized and, and around. And they like the fact that they, that obstruction was taken off there, struck in. But I sometimes wonder if some of their own people who sell real change can't walk the sidewalks because, you know, they're using a walker, they're in a wheelchair. They, their mobility is not what it used to be. And my mom, I mean, she's in great shape and, and looks fantastic, but man, I hold her arm when we're walking in downtown because she's just not in the space to think like, man, there's going to be a six inch gap in the sidewalk when you're not paying attention, certainly at night, certainly if it's raining or something like that. So yeah, uh, livability, transportation, certainly topics that I love talking about. I can't wait. I would like to get on those board, those, um, committees if I'm elected to city council, because they are very important to me. Um, art, music, culture. I want to have that back in Seattle. I want to be the absolute place you go for those things. You know, I want to, I want the band to want to come into Seattle to play. Um, one of the reasons they go to the Tacoma Dome is, I didn't know this, that one of my friends who's a promoter says the Tacoma Dome's free. Mm. That they just give it to whoever wants to play. And, you know, if you're big enough, you have to meet some criteria. You and I probably can't go down there and just decide <laughs> we want to jam out in the Tacoma Dome. But, uh, you know, sometimes when you see those big acts, you're like, God, why do they choose the Tacoma Dome? Like, no offense, Tacoma, but what a dump. Yeah. Um, this is the Tacoma Dome. Tacoma's actually getting pretty cool. But... Uh, I think the sound quality is awful in there. It's not a great venue to watch music as far as I'm concerned. Well, turns out from what I've been told is Tacoma gives it to the artists for free, hoping that they, well, not hoping, but knowing that they're going to get the revenue off of, you know, sales tax and people coming into the city and staying at a hotel and, you know, renting an Uber and, and things that like that. Sense. So I always thought monster truck jam was yeah. the only thing that made sense down there. That was the one yeah. thing I was like, this yeah. place was made for that. Yeah, we used to have to go down there. Now, I didn't wrestle, but um, my brother-in-law is really into wrestling and they have like the big wrestling tournaments at the yes. Tacoma Dome. I was like, well, that makes complete Total sense. sense. Yeah. That's the Tacoma Dome. Um, but yeah, when you see like Elton John, you're like, what? How is Elton John playing the Tacoma Dome? Like, right. what is going on? <laughs> If only we had a giant venue here in Seattle that we just built that cost us billions of dollars for them to play in. Um, I will give it up to Climate Pledge. I was not a big fan of that design review when it when it came through, but it is pretty cool. It's very expensive. It yes. is very expensive. <laughs> but um, I, I want to there with comp tickets and still spent three hundred bucks oh, before I left listen, with with a date. I mean, it's that you know, uh, <laughs> that way that they use their. Um, they're vending. Yeah. You know, whether it be, if you're into adult beverages, fine. If you're not into adult beverages, it doesn't matter because you will never know how much you spent until you get home and you look at your credit card and you're like, what, what just, just happened? happened? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, same thing. I was, uh, my, f- was it my first day? I, I had bought uh, Eric Church tickets, but somehow I was given hockey tickets. And I, I'd never been, I've never been, I had never been to an NHL game. And, uh, I was really excited, you know, my first one. I remember trying to go to the Canucks game. Unfortunately, they were in the playoffs, so tickets were like $300. And I, knowing nothing about hockey, I was like, ah, I'm good. But somebody gave me tickets to go see um, NHL, and I was really excited. I was like, okay, first game. This is cool. And I even brought somebody with me that really knows about hockey, mm-hmm. and she was really stoked to go, too. So it was really nice tickets. I mean, I think we're like five rows center ice. I mean, it was – they were really spending tickets. So, of course, I'm feeling very generous. I'm like, let's, you know, let's go. Drinks are on me, blah, blah, blah. I think I ended up buying like three rounds of drinks. And nothing serious. I mean, we, no. first of all, the drinks come out in thimbles. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I looked at my credit card the next morning. I'm like, what did I uh, what did I spend on? Like, what would I, did I buy a jersey and I don't remember? Like, no. this is insane. So That was my experience. We yeah. kind of got drinks before going. They were like, no, we're going there. For, let's go there. Yeah. We'll do it there. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, I you know spent a fair amount of tipping the bartender, thinking, "Oh, I'm coming here tomorrow night for Eric Church, so I'll have the same bartender. I'll just keep going up to him." Yeah. Well, first of all, it doesn't matter because everything is on the gun. There's no like, you know, hooking anybody up or by any stretch of the imagination. And then you know, on top of that, they're they're smart enough to make sure that they rotate all their bartenders all throughout the yeah. stadium every day, so you never get the same person it's like twice. Like the casino, no yeah. the oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it does go back to this thing that I've. Um, you know, nobody's really asked me about. There's two things that I want to mention that nobody's really asked me about. Is um, 
you know, I came from a cash heavy industry uh, being a bartender. I'm probably the last generation of that is a cash heavy bartender. I mean, most people, 98% of people pay by credit card now, I think. And uh, I've seen a lot of venues now go cashless. Mm -hmm. And I I have a problem with that. Yes. Um, Cash is legal tender. And the idea that you don't take cash, I understand some of the logistics of it. I understand that there's, for, for example, some of the stadiums, their biggest problem is theft <laughs> amongst their employees yeah. taking cash, that it's easy to pocket a 20 or a 100 or whatever. And I understand the idea that maybe some businesses, especially smaller ones like coffee shops or something like that, don't want to deal with it because, you know, there's a chance of being robbed. Mm-hmm. But it is legal tender. Yes. And if you don't have a checking account and you don't have a savings account and you don't have a credit card or you don't have a cash card, it's very difficult to go and purchase items. And I think that, that should be something that we talk about as a society, but I am a um, proponent of making sure that cash is used, can be used at any uh, point of sale. I don't know why this isn't stood on more. It's really yeah. hard to be- Seems um, like an easy one, an easy one to get behind, an easy yeah. one that makes sense. And, you know, I, I'm i not what, what would be described as a kind of a, a squishy, soft-hearted person, but, man, how do you expect a homeless person to, like, go buy some food? You know, right. they, they don't have a credit card. And we like, oh, we'll give them an ATM. Like, who's going to take that time? Nobody's going to go down and fill an ATM. Like, here's my, the money that I've either begged for or worked for or whatever, however you got it, and then I'm going to put it in the form of an ATM and be responsible enough. I mean, they're at the point in their life where responsibility is probably not something that they have a lot of right now. So, yeah, I'd like to see more venues take more cash. It drives me absolutely nuts when I go into a place and, you know, pull out a 20 like, oh, sorry, sir, we don't take cash. I'm like, I feel like you're obligated to take this. And, and a lot, <laughs> sometimes I've even said, like, listen, I don't even need any change. You know, it's 15 bucks. I'd rather just give you the 20 and walk away than go through and get my credit card out. And listen, I have nothing, no problem with it. There's plenty of venues and I'd I'd rather just tap that card and walk away. But it's, I think maybe it's just one of those things that I'm, it's like a hill I'm willing to die on. Like, listen, man, I still carry cash on me. I still like having cash. If I'm buying a $3 cup of coffee, I'm just going to give you the four bucks and and walk away. We don't need to make a big, you know, digital transaction of it. And then I do worry about the future. You know, where, what are we going to be looking like? And this isn't conspiracy theory or anything like that. This is this, you know, if banks have the ability to shut down your, your funds because Mm -hmm. they don't agree with you on something and all your money is in basically digital, I I have a problem with that. I want to have a certain amount of cash, a certain amount of uh, real transactions going going through it really does trick you and i are very aligned on this i haven't found yeah. anybody else to really talk about this with but yeah well especially my younger generation my 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 colleagues that are you know 20 or 30 they're like oh god this old man conspiracy theory yes. of like oh we just have to have cash and you know things are gonna, and they it's absurd because a lot of times you know if, if somebody you know the tradition is if you buy lunch one day, somebody buys you lunch the next day. So we kind of have a, an equal footing or, or sometimes if somebody's like, Hey man, I got, I got you the marriage ticket. And I'm like, Hey, here's, here's the money for it. And I give them cash. They look at me like, Oh, really? Yeah. I got to get the cash. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> dude, you got to get the cash. And plus it's embarrassing that you don't even have a dollar to right. you, like a real physical dollar <laughs> yeah. on you. Um, yeah, here's, here's a little walking around money for you, kid. <laughs> and some of them is funny. Like six months later, like I still got the 20 you gave me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. You at least have $20 to get you home sometime. Just the um, blind blindness of the following. There's a coffee. Stand. I won't say who they are because they make great coffee. I'm yeah. still going to go there. Sure. But, uh, you know, I work weird hours a lot of times and they've dealt with theft and such. And I went there the other night to get <laughs> something and same thing. I said, well, we don't take cash. I said, you just keep the rest i don't care <laughs> and they're like we don't even know how to do that they were just blindly like we, yeah. we just don't do it and i'm like I, I had to leave no coffee my wallet got i don't know where it went it's yeah in this place for weeks so i'm trying to get all my ids back yeah and i just felt like i had to drive away with no coffees if my card got declined to get the embarrassing drive away and yeah out the window well yeah i'm and you know i'm the same way i always have the cash in my pocket but uh, there's times where like my credit cards in a bag or something like yeah. that i'm like I, you're making me gonna go walk all the way back to my car to get yes. my wallet out to get my credit card out to come back in here i'm like it's it's a sandwich, man. <laughs> yeah. I would have been far less yeah. frustrated if they tell me to F off. It wouldn't have bothered me internally yeah. as much as me. Until yeah. They wouldn't take the cash. It was bizarre to me. Yeah. How much that really worked. So it, w- one of the weird things, I know that there's um, a state legislator that is, is discussing that and trying to get it through. Uh, I think it's still in committee, mm-hmm. but I think it's getting a little bit of traction. We'll see if that becomes law. I wouldn't mind somebody actually making that happen so we can just yeah. kind of universally say, 
listen, this is this is a good thing. And yes, there are some inherent risks to it of getting robbed. And I completely feel for the weed shops. You know, that is that is uh, yet another couple of task force I've had to be on several times of, of serial robbers of weed shops because they are so cash heavy. I do think there's ways to secure that and make it better um, that I think maybe the state should not just require but pay for mm-hmm. um, in order to make these venues a little bit safer. Um, I think there'd be a lot less uh, people that are brazen enough to, to rob. It's not that hard to rob a weed shop at this point anymore. It doesn't look like that to me anyway. Right. Um, the other thing that I doesn't really get discussed that I'd love to bring up just so I'm fully transparent going forward is I do not think the city council gets paid what they should for being the stewards of a $7.4 billion budget. And, and here's my theory behind it is roughly the city council gets paid $130,000 a year, which f- for a while, and I'm not sure if this is still true, but for a while they were the second highest paid city council in the entire country. San Jose was the only one that got paid more. Now I believe the King County Council actually makes uh, not a lot more, but more than the Seattle City Council. And I know $130,000 sounds like a lot of people to a lot of money, especially if you're in the Midwest or in an area that, you know, $100,000 is, you know, that's rich. In Seattle, that's just not, you know, I think, you know, I think the median income right now is about $125,000 uh, in the city of, or in Seattle proper. Mm-hmm. So, my issue with the Seattle City Council and why I believe they should get paid more is we're not attracting the best people with that yes. salary. You either get one of two folks, in my opinion, is you get people that are so well off that have made so much money in other aspects of their life. You know, they're Microsoft millionaires, they're whatever, they're, they're significant others make all the money and they've, they, yeah, whatever, you know, like we live in the nicest house, a multi-million dollar house, you know, $130,000, like, We'll put that towards our kids' college or, you know, <laughs> throw it in crypto. I, they, they, just, they just don't care about that. They, they, you know that they've never looked at what they get paid by the city of Seattle being the city council member. The second group of people that you get that I think that run for city council have never close made close to that their entire adult life. You know, they've had jobs where, you know, maybe they were a social worker, maybe they're a community activist, but they've never made more than, you know, 25, 30, 40, maybe even $50,000. And now all of a sudden they think they've hit some kind of like economic windfall. They're like, oh my gosh, $130,000. Like I've made that in three years doing my old job. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's nothing wrong with those people running. Of course there's not. And there's nothing wrong with those people being on city council. But I also would argue that I don't think we're drawing the best pool of people for the city council. And like I said, I'd really like an eclectic group of uh, council members. So I certainly would represent a blue collar renting um, downtown advocate who knows a lot about public safety. But I'm also somebody who makes, I don't want to say significantly more than that, but I certainly would be taking a decent size pay cut mm-hmm. to go on the city council. And I'm willing to do that. I'm not, you know, grumbling. But I'll say this after about a year, if I have proven and we have proven as a city council that we are making effective steps forward, that you have metrics to see our success. It doesn't just feel better, but we can show the metrics of our success. I will be introducing legislation to pay the city council a more effective salary for being the steward of a $7.4 billion budget. Yeah. So I, I don't want to spring that on people. You know, if I do get elected and all of a sudden a year later, they're like, what? He, he wants what? Oh, weird. Another guy who wants to like raise his own salary, raise the salaries of his cohorts. You know, uh, I want to say that early is I, I think that somewhere closer to $200,000 would be a more effective rate. And that goes for the mayor as well. You know, the, the mayor, the mayor and the chief of police, I don't think make nearly as much as our top tier police officers and firefighters. Now, granted, different jobs. Um, I will defend some of the salaries that they make because they have basically decided they do not want any personal life whatsoever, mm-hmm. and all they do is work overtime. Um, those top people that you see on those uh, public disclosures every year, I, you know, I know most of those folks. They basically live at the precinct. You yeah. know, they live. I don't want to say out of their car, but I mean, they boy, they spend a lot of time at work, and um, we can certainly argue whether or not that's a great use of funds. We can argue whether or not it's a great use of their time. Um, it is their time. They are legally allowed to do that. They are allowed by the contract of the city of Seattle. Um, I would also argue that we need them right now. You know, we don't have a lot of other choices. You know, these people do have to fill those roles, but I've always said, you know, 
you can make almost as much as you want in the Seattle Police Department, but man, they will take the hours from you. They will absolutely take the hours from you. So running for Seattle Council has been different because, you know, especially this unpaid leave of absence for the last, what are we, almost a month into it now. It's been really different for me to kind of have my own time management right now and, and decide. And I put a lot of time into this. You know, there's rarely a day that I'm not up by 530. There's rarely a night that I'm not in bed before 1130. So haven't been getting a lot of sleep, but um, it has let me see a little bit more of my own time management and see how I'm using things. And when I am just a police officer, I notice that I work a ton of overtime, of course. Um, but I also realize that it's kind of stealing some of my, I mean, not stealing, it's affecting and, and using a lot of my life. Sure. And so at the end of it all, hopefully I'm 80, 90, 100 years old when I'm at the end. Am I going to be really happy that I spent that much time doing overtime? Right. And I would ask the other officers and firefighters and nurses, mm-hmm. um, you know, that $250,000 a year wasn't worth it. Right. So, Because you can certainly make it, but it's your time. Yeah, ask you this. So what I've gotten from you is this, you're not looking for a career in politics. You really have no desire to become mayor or anything beyond this. You want to be part of a transformative moment. What does a successful tenure, an air marshal tenure look like? When are you ready to hand the baton off? Yeah, um, it's an excellent question. I'm 49 years old. I turned 50 in November. Um, Certainly not having a midlife crisis because uh, up here, uh, I think I still feel like I'm about 30 ish. I don't know how old you feel, but I, I oftentimes feel I'm about 30. Like I'm old enough to know better, but I still feel really young. <laughs> and the idea that I'm turning 50, that just doesn't seem real. Like 50 years old when I was 30, that seemed like an old guy. <laughs> but then I look at myself in some gray and I, all right, maybe I am 50. Um, I've always followed politics very closely, mostly on the national level. Like I, I used to kind of talk down about local politics. I was like, oh, these, you know, it just never really interested me that much. You know, it was, it, it didn't really make the news. It was harder to debate the nuances of, of small town politics and, and city politics. And of course, you know, the very famous saying is every good thing that changes happens locally. You know, you, you need that local politics. You need those people that are engaged. And um, while I have been, as far as like voting, um, you know, I've, I didn't spend a lot of time going to city council meetings. Uh, my first time probably watching a full city council meeting was like three months ago, mm-hmm. like from start to finish and not just getting the highlights or what the news told me or something like that. And kind of seeing, cause I was curious. I was like, man, do I, do I know how to be a city council person? Like, what does that look like? What is, what are, what are the procedures, you know, when, when you're sitting there on the dais, um, turns out that not a lot of people show up to them, uh, <laughs> Even city council people aren't showing up to their own city council meetings. Um, but after about a week of watching city council meetings, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm way more than qualified to be a city councilman. <laughs> um, so, no, I really didn't have any ambitions of being a, a politician per se. And sometimes, God, I, I have a hard time getting the word out. I It has such a negative connotation, a politician. Oh, you're such a politician. <laughs> I hate that. I just absolutely hate it. So I've certainly been probably more open, honest, and, and forthcoming and, and probably not as tactically smart about my politics mm-hmm. as uh, maybe if I had an advisor. So obviously I'm, well, maybe not obvious. I'm running this whole campaign on my own. I, I couldn't get representation to start off with because um, I'm not a Democrat. I told the Democratic Party, because they were curious at the beginning, um, that I will never, ever vote for safe injection sites. You will, you'll never get a vote out of me, a positive vote for me that, out of that. Um, I do believe in shelter, clean, safe shelters first housing earned, which is kind of against where we are as the Democratic Party, where they are as the Democratic Party. Um, but same on the, the Republican side. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of Republicans in city politics. There's not a lot of Republicans in the state of Washington. Uh, certainly not in the three King, Snohomish, Pierce County area. So uh, most of the Republicans that have reached out to me that wanted to help with the campaign were outside of the state. And when I say outside of the state, like way outside of the state, you know, I was getting D.C., Virginia, some Tennessee. Uh, yeah, just, you know, to the point where I'm Googling what the uh, the area code is, I'm like, where does this person live? Like, <laughs> Sioux City, Iowa, like, what do they know about? Like, no, I'm not even answering this. So, 
Um, I just don't fit into any of those political molds. And by being an independent, it's been really difficult. There's just nobody really out there that represents independence. And uh, I thought I had a company out of California for a while. They seemed like they were good to go. I was a little concerned because they were out of San Diego, and I don't think they really understood Seattle politics. And eventually, um, they sent a proposal, which was a lot of money. I think they wanted 50, they, they thought it was going to cost $57,000 for me to get a city council position. And then the last minute, they actually backed out. Um, one of their, their board members who had been to Seattle a long, long time ago just thought there's just, there's no way they're going to elect a white police officer in the city of Seattle and certainly one who's not a Democrat. And so <laughs> I did my best to argue. I should, I shouldn't have even argued. I shouldn't even try to like plea my case to him because by then it's like, if, listen, if you don't want to represent me or you want to try to help me out, then what's the point? Um, but moving forward, I've kind of done. I haven't kind of, I've done almost everything on my own. Like I do have uh, that person who's the PIO who no longer is a PIO, but uh, she's certainly helped me with my social media uh, and done a phenomenal job. She does my press releases for me. She's a great sounding board. I certainly probably talk to her more than she probably wants to hear me call. She's been so nice to pick up the phone every time. Um, I have had some people in former campaigns uh, be great advisors for me and great sounding boards. Um, the speech that you, um, filmed me doing when I launched, uh, were my words, but mm -hmm. clearly I'm kind of a wordy person. So, uh, it was pared down. It was edited by a very good friend of mine who used to, uh, write speeches for the Obama administration. So he pared down my <laughs> long winded Cause I think the first version of the speech was like 25 minutes long. And he's like, mm -hmm. listen, bro. <laughs> you can't do a 25 minute intro for a city council. Like he goes, you need to make like five. I'm like, I can't say all this in five. He's like, you're right. You can't say all this in five. <laughs> so we ended up agreeing to like, I think it was like, I don't know. You probably know better than me. I think it was like 15, 12 or 15 minutes or something yeah. like that. So we, we agreed. So I, I've had some help. Um, but largely it's been on my own. So when I talk about my political future, you know, somebody, Many people have said, well, this was a really good run for you. You know, I ended up raising almost $30,000 on my own. I didn't use the democracy vouchers because, one, I just think they're kind of a, too new of a system. I don't think that many people knew what they were. Um, I think a lot of people get the democracy vouchers and put them somewhere and then forget where they're at. So, um, And it also limits the max amount that you can donate to the campaign. So if you use the democracy vouchers, $300 is the max that any individual can uh, donate. Um, or any entity, a business or whatever. If you don't use the democracy vouchers, and this is what Sarah Nelson did, uh, the max is $600. And I just kind of thought I knew enough restaurant owners, enough people who own businesses, enough people that $600 wasn't a huge stretch for them that I thought I'd raise more money that way. And it turns out I was probably right. Um, my average dollar donation is not just a little higher than every other candidate. It's considerably higher. I think most of the candidates are roughly about 100 bucks. is their um, their donation and mine's roughly about 235 uh, dollars is the average uh, donation so that 600 dollars obviously makes a big difference i certainly have a fair amount of my 25 dollars and i very much am thankful for somebody they're usually perfect strangers people that i've never met but have heard me on the radio or seen me in an event and donated 25 bucks which i really really appreciate but uh moving forward um when people say like man you should try this if you don't win this time you should do it you should try to do it again mm -hmm. and I'm in probably mile 23 of this 26.2 mile marathon. <laughs> and the idea of somebody saying, you know, you should go do another marathon right after this. You know, it just makes me shake my head. I'm like, you're out of your mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have any intentions of doing this again. Um, I've said it a few times before when I first started running, it was frustration. It was, um, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired was my kind of my tag. And it was all true. It still is. But I will say that in reflection to this whole thing, and, and you know, you get a lot of time to think, a lot of time to think. I don't know why it is, but I have some weird guilt um, about not doing enough as a police officer, of watching the city suffer and get bruised and battered, and and um, there's just so much I can do as a police officer, and and I'm really proud of the work we do. Catching bad guys, catching felons, catching violent people is, man, it's extremely satisfying. I, I highly recommend being a police officer if you're interested. But when it comes down to it, you know, when I go out at night or when I see my friend's shot get broken into, I mean, um, Carl, who owns Virginia Inn, 
great supporter of mine, been a friend of mine for 15, 20 years, bought the Virginia Inn right before COVID mm. and had to suffer through that, you know, worked every single day doing to-go orders for years, you know, just got his broken window broken in again, you know, but not only did they try to break his window, they tried to break his window, they couldn't break the window, they tried to burn the window, they took like a welding tool to try to get through the, the window. And I bring that up because um, <clears throat> he's the kind of person I want to run for. He's the kind of person that, like, why I feel like I can't do more. And uh, at this point, I'm leaving it to the citizens of Seattle. Do enough people know who I am? I'm not sure. I mean, this is one of the reasons I want to do your podcast is just an extra time to, like, speak my mind, get more of my thoughts out there because those two-minute answers that you're giving in Q&As are, are tough, you know. Tell me about drug addiction. You have two minutes to answer those. Like, ah, oh, it's, it's too much more difficult and complicated than that. I don't know if I'll run again. I don't think I will. I think this is the, the, the one chance I'm giving the city of Seattle to get somebody who's in public safety on the city council. And if they choose not to, I think I'll be okay with that. Mm-hmm. I think I'll go back to being a cop, which I love. And I think I'll probably just kind of disappear into the ether. You know, I'll, I'll, not live a selfish life because policing is not selfish. It's definitely for the public and it's definitely for public service. But I don't know. I don't know if I have it in me to do this a, a second time. Sure. I don't want to ever say it, never. And uh, you know what? Listen, I, I've also joked. City council is pretty cool, but being a mayor is way cooler. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can do a little bit. You can do a lot as city council. But man, you can do a whole lot more being yeah. mayor. So I have said uh, to a few friends and to uh, maybe a venue or two that, if I do get elected and I, and I have a good time and I feel like I'm, I'm making progress um, and we build some coalitions and we're moving forward, I could definitely see me doing two terms as city council, two, four, four, two four-year terms, and then certainly throwing my hat in for the mayor's office. Like, I, I, I hate it when people are like, you know, some senators like, oh, no, I, I know. I would never, I've never even thought about being president of the United States. Like, listen, dude, you're a U.S. Senator. You have definitely thought about being the president <laughs> of the United States. Male, female, it doesn't matter. If you're a United States Senator, you've thought about being president. Heck, I've thought about being president. I'm just a street level cop from Seattle with a AA education. So, um, <clears throat> certainly wouldn't say that I'd win. You know, I don't know if the city of Seattle will ever uh, have a police officer as the mayor, but, um, or former police officer, I would be. But, I throw that out there. I, you know, I I do believe in age limits. You know, I, I think I'd like to retire at a fairly young age. And I'm f- like I said, I'll be 50. If I get elected, I'll be 50, 58. I would probably run for mayor um, if I got elected. I mean, the odd chance that I get elected. Sure. At 62, uh, maybe if I get two terms, okay, 66. But I'm absolutely punching after that. I'm going to go sit on a boat on Lake Union and, and <laughs> never look back. Uh and I might just do that earlier. I mean, I, my dad was really, really fortunate to retire when he's 55, and he's 75 now. And, man, he's had great 20 years of being retired. So that appeals to me as well. We'll see. I don't I don't know what my political future is. I'm just kind of in the throes of the first three months of trying this all on my own. I mean, you've kind of seen me at the beginning, and yeah. now you're kind of, I guess, maybe, hopefully not the end, but seeing me right before. I hope not. This is, yeah, this yeah. is Sunday. Primaries are on Tuesday. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll see what my what my tolerance is moving forward. There's there's some weird scenarios. There, uh, Teresa Mosqueda is running for King County Council, so there might be an appointment that could be made to the city council in her position. Then there will be probably a special election for that position. Mm-hmm. You know, that's hers is a citywide position. Do I have enough um, appeal to go citywide? I probably trying to think. I probably lean towards the idea that a police officer, a white middle-aged police officer isn't appealing to citywide. Sure. I think I just, I live in D seven and it's just, I'm, I'm in the kind of that position that they would maybe think about it. So I don't know if citywide, but who knows? I'm not a political expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, <clears throat> the other option is that, you know, people are saying four years from now, I'm like, I don't know. I, I'll be 53, 54 and probably be making a fair amount more at the police department. And, you know, maybe I'm living my life that I want to live and doing this all over. Or, you know, my mom likes to say, you know, this would be a great job if you retired, Mm -hmm. you know, retire from the police department and then run for politics. I'm like, no way. This job is taxing, man. I don't know. I don't see how somebody does in their sixties or seventies. It's too much. For sure. Yeah. 
give me the 30 second. We're in the elevator. I'm yeah. about to go vote. Yeah. Why you? I am a current Seattle police officer who lives in downtown Seattle. I know more about public safety than anybody who is on the city council or who is running for city council. And right now, public safety is the absolute number one thing that we have to think about going forward. I know what programs work. I know what programs don't work. And I am honest and vocal about telling people to their face what I think. And I don't hold any punches. I'm not rude. I do want to work with people. But if you're proposing ideas that I think are just going to be a waste of money and a waste of time, I'm going to tell them to your face, this doesn't work. And this is why. I can show people what is working, what is not working. And I really do want to see changes in this city in months, not years. Thank you for coming all the way out here. I've been really looking forward to sitting down. Steve, to this is uh, this is exactly what I was hoping for. I think this is more of a therapy session than <laughs> <laughs> a podcast. I finally got to get some points out. I'm probably going to be kicking myself on my drive home. Like, ah, oh, I forgot to talk about that. But uh, this has been fantastic. And I I think this is the new form of media. I think this is how so. we we talk and get things forward. I mean, I, I'll i be honest. I'd love you to get Andrew Lewis down here and and hear what he has to say where he doesn't just filibuster. Now, granted, I feel like I've talked a whole bunch, but, um, you know, we don't get long form opportunities to hear what people think and, and what they what they really want to do. I, I just heard Dave Riker. I, I hardly know anything about it. I know he was the King County Sheriff. I know yeah. he was in Congress. Uh, I know he was part of the Green River Task Force and, you know, usually associated with, you know, being an integral part of that. But I didn't really know much about him. And I finally heard a long-form podcast from him uh, this last weekend. He was on Brandy Cruz's show where I think she had him on for almost an hour. Yeah. And it was really nice. It was just a really nice way to hear about somebody's thoughts. And I'd like that more often. I wish people would would do that and we'd have these venues but i think this is the future of media yeah i, I hope so i really do I, it's nice to be able to come in here and not have the gatekeepers and all the other stuff going. commercial on. break music <laughs> playing in the background <laughs> like you know guys wrap it up let's go and yeah. then you know you leave and you're like man that that was quick well hope for two things one i hope everybody goes out and votes but get out and vote even if it isn't for you so be it i would be okay if you know, there's 110,000 people in this district, 71,550 registered voters. Only 8,000 people got Andrew Lewis through four years ago. 6,000 people got Jim Pugil through uh, four years ago. 18% was roughly the, the figure that showed up. I'm going to be really upset if only that amount shows up. You know, if I lose and only 18% of the people decided, that's going to be a tough pill to swallow. If it's 50% or more and I lose, then hey, listen, that the people had their say and they don't want you. Okay, I'm super okay with that. I'll go back to being a cop. You know, the other flip side of that, the thing that I, I was probably going to kick myself if I didn't say this, the worst case scenario, the absolute, in my mind, the worst case scenario is not losing. Mm. The worst case scenario is winning and having seven other people on the city council be absolute knuckleheads. Right. Worse off than this city council, you know, more extreme than this city council. And you know, Sarah Nelson and I just beating our heads against the dais for the next four years where you can't get anything done because you really do need to build little coalitions and you need to have people that are common sense, that are honest about what their approaches are and can explain why they're doing it this way. And they work closely with each other. The city council has to do that going forward. That is really honestly one of my, my worst scenarios is winning and not being able to do anything. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Man, I really, really appreciate, appreciate it. That. Thanks, Steve.